I used to work in an industrial area that tends to be secluded and dark at night, with minimal lighting along the roads. I also live close to this previous job, so I would walk home often instead of taking the bus, since I can't drive. The bus routes tend to be a bit awkward, and also have long wait times, so usually I just decide to hoof it instead. One night in early October, I had been walking through a parking lot to get to my place. I actually had to walk through a few of them to get back to my home. However, the parking lots close to the main road were where these incidents occurred. Anyway, as I was walking through this desolate abandoned parking lot, I was listening to music and enjoying my walk in peace when I got this suspicious feeling that I should look behind me. I turned around to check, only to see an individual wearing a hoodie and track pants who appeared to possibly be a woman. This person was very pale and seemed to be watching me after emerging from the bushes and trees she was hiding behind. She picked up the pace from behind me, but continued walking horizontal to me. I ran across the main road, and when I looked back, I could see her standing next to a set of trees. It appeared in that moment that she realized that I saw her watching me, and she immediately jumped behind some foliage to hide. I got into some random apartments to hide from her, and wait there for some time until I was sure she was gone. After a while, I left and went back to my house. I told my mom all about this incident, and she said I should have immediately called the police. I know I probably should have, but it also doesn't stop there. So, now it's early November. I had this weird feeling again that there was someone in this parking lot I was walking through. I was actually walking through a different lot this time, as the previous incident had freaked me out so much with someone watching me. As I was walking through this empty lot, the same person wearing a hoodie emerged from behind a parked trailer, talking on her phone. I was now thoroughly freaked out, and decided to pick up my pace and get to the main road as fast as possible, without alerting this person that I felt threatened by them. As I was getting ready to cross the road, this person did so as well and watched me as I went across. I booked it to some other random apartment and hid in there until I assumed she would be gone. Now, the last time this happened was mid-November, about a week after the second incident. I decided this time to walk through the same parking lot that I'd seen her in the second time. Dumb, I know. This time, she emerged from behind a trailer again and started walking immediately toward me. This time, I decided to just run and get to the main road. I ran across the street and looked back trying to see her once more, but this time, she was completely gone. I assumed she must have been hiding behind a trailer or something, as there was no way she could have gotten out of the lot in that time. I decided to hide in a different building this time as well. Since then, I haven't seen her, as it's been snowing. It was probably too cold out for her to wait around in the lot for me. I also no longer work at that same place, so I no longer have to take that same route to work. I guess it could have possibly been a man since they were a little bit tall, but I distinctly heard a female voice when she was talking on her phone, and when I saw her the first time, I thought I might have been able to make out a white female with dark hair. I have not gone to the police with this information, but I still might. I doubt it will actually do anything, but my mom thinks it's the right thing to do. Now first off, I just wanted to say this has been going on for years. We were literally 13 or 14 when this all started going down. I'm 18 now and have a lot more common sense, or at least I would like to think so. So please try to look at this from a 13 year old's perspective and try not to judge our actions based on this. I guess this also gives some more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I've ridden horses all my life, but I've never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place because of this over the following years. I'll start with a bit of backstory. 
The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for about five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center, as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrows of hay. She told me about a farm that was just a bit down the road from my house, in a little village we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm, and he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owned it now. I was immediately intrigued, so I pushed for a little more info. She told me that the man who now owned it, Elliot, was a pig farmer. Apparently, he'd murdered his brother-in-law who was asking for him to pay back 150 k in debt, ground him up into sausages, and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when police eventually tracked them down, the DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually tried for the murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. The ironic thing is that he moved those animals without a moving permit, which is also illegal. So, in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock instead, and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, pretty much everyone in the village knew he really did it. Now that we've gotten all that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I'd be keeping my horse at. I'd known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend from earlier. Nothing particularly scary had happened while I was riding for her, except one time. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know exactly who owned it, and we weren't sure if they'd be friendly, so we proceeded with a lot of caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields, until the path came to a stop. We saw there were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn, so instead of passing through those gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of this farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward randomly. Annie started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch, when I looked over toward the farm. I saw a man was stood completely still, staring at us. At first, I honestly thought he was a scarecrow, as I had no idea how long he'd been watching us for. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up. There was just something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that someone was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and hadn't seen us coming. We went into a full flat-out gallop, literally shitting ourselves, because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. While we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory, they never did. It was meant for us, to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were actually where the trail was supposed to carry on, but who in their right mind would just go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting towards us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we'd get in trouble for trespassing. This is only where the problems begin, though. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out. A white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But nothing too serious happened. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark since the days are shorter in winter. This particular evening, we were goofing around and laughing like 14-year-olds do, when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that scary farmer owned. I began to imitate it, joking around and not exactly expecting a reply. I was surprised when it did. I found this hilarious, and Annie began joining in as well. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight is definitely a red flag. 
Any real owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing it wasn't one of its own. This one always replied, and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise sounded very weird. That was when Annie turned to me and said, That's not an owl. We realized we'd just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is hard when you have a thousand two hundred pound animal squishing through the mud beneath you. We decided to say screw it and gallop the rest of the fields back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil, leading straight back to our house. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off, and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black, except for the dull light coming from behind us. We couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut the hay bags open with, and hid behind the stable door. We waited for ten minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too much noise. I decided to be the brave one and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside, thinking I could jump on one if I saw someone and get out of there quicker than they could run. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness now, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie. There's no one here, we were just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake off the terror we had just experienced. That was only until the next day, when it became very, very real. The next morning was really hot. The ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, we noticed there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field where we had heard those owls, all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot then came about. We told our parents, however, they decided we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us at all. That was that. Those boot prints started appearing around an awful lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We'd notice the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate, then continuing in the opposite direction. We never actually saw anyone watching us, though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night, and we went looking for it in the dark. The next morning, footprints everywhere. Those Bigfoot footprints. Around this time as well, our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree had been brought down onto it. Then it was set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up until around 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped in the way. At this time, the trail basically became inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lived on the corner, who told us he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it, as he was illegally blocking a bridal path. We tried to report it, but the council refused to go near him as he was too scary, apparently. He told us instead that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us the fuck out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. until 9 p.m. clearing a path through all the detritus. We also wrote fuck you and stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles, and our path was completely covered over. We were at a loss for what to do, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that kept horses. Without telling us a name, she said this, You have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the person who makes people disappear. That's when it clicked. The whole time we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same fucking Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family but nothing came of it. They still thought we were just being dramatic. Mysterious things kept happening. Bones were now being left all over the place. Again, I'm guessing to scare us. I have photo evidence for most of this as well. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week now. 
we started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We even told friends that if we disappeared to make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We'd just been out for a ride, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about two-minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, when immediately the smell hit me. It was vile, and I knew what it was immediately. Death. Rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner had overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight to go with us. Annie had a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up instantly. It was so strong and disgusting. Ryan soon joined with us and said, Someone has definitely been here. This just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomit fiasco and rejoined us in the search. I don't really know what we're going to find here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After about an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. That's when we saw bags of white flesh. Clear ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside of them, but there were no holes, implying whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good long while before it was cut up and put into bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day. Reassured by Ryan that he would deal with whatever the fuck this was, we assumed he would call the police. We got home, cried to our parents again, but they still dismissed us. How were we being dramatic when we literally just found chunks of rotting flesh out in the woods? Anyhow, Ryan is hands down one of the loveliest men on this planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He did not call the police. Instead, he buried the meat. He didn't throw it out. He didn't do anything else with it. He buried it. What the fuck? We assume now it's because he's old and vulnerable and didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I don't know why Annie and I didn't call the police ourselves. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan now that he was involved. And no one else believed us, so why would the police anyway? This is around where my story concludes. I know it's unsatisfying, but I'm no longer at that farm. I still have horses, though. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think because I've kept this up for five whole years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there instead. Me and Annie are still best friends and reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for three years. We'll never know what that meat was or if Elliot had anything to do with it. Nor will we ever know why he followed us all those years just trying to stop us riding down our bridal path. I'm not sure I really want to know either. This is admittedly a lengthy story. I mean, it's my dad we're talking about and I've been alive for 30 years. There's no way I could cover everything that's happened, so I'm going to try and do my best to create an abridged version. My childhood was difficult. I was born with a neuromuscular disability that affects my entire body, rendering me weaker than able-bodied folk. My parents didn't have much in the way of money, but they made somewhat of a life for the three of us. Two years later, my brother joined the family. As I grew up, I became more aware of my father's misgivings. He'd do things like buy himself a brand new set of skis and a ski pass, while refusing to spend any money on the rest of us. My mother was scraping and scrimping just to get by. Everything we owned was pretty much secondhand or old or broken. While my dad had all these fancy new things like skis, a bike, whatever he wanted really. He was irresponsible, disrespectful, manipulative, and he loved to play mind games. A real winner. Over the span of my life, I watched him belittle, bully, manipulate, and emotionally abuse everyone close to him. 
He would do things like burst into my room unannounced while I was naked and take photos of me, a good number of which mysteriously disappeared. He generally refused to let my brother and I spend time with our friends. As our pediatric doctor put it, he was checked out, totally disinterested in the family. Whenever he did engage, he would often encourage us to push our physical limits, sometimes even to the point of injury or serious risk. Things like taking us on ski runs that were way too difficult after we were already exhausted, taking us swimming when we were sick, etc. These may seem innocuous, but altogether combined with his constant bullying, he had successfully cultivated an environment of control via fear, like a gotcha machine that absorbs love and spits out sneers. As I continued to grow older, I started to see just how messed up this behavior was. I tried to talk to him about these things on multiple occasions, only to be met with complete denial. If I ever addressed a fault of his, he would deflect, derail, and start talking shit about my mom instead. Now, don't get me wrong, my mom had her own issues which were certainly not made better in an abusive atmosphere, but I hated talking about her issues to placate my father's weird obsession. I gathered all of my evidence and ruminations, typed up a neat little email explaining precisely why I would not be continuing our relationship, and pressed send. I took great care to explain that if he was interested in being a grown-up and actually addressing these issues and working through them instead of being in denial, I'd be happy to engage once again someday. There was no reply, and no further attempt at contact. A few years went by since then, and I found myself married to my best friend and the love of my life. I was in therapy working through my issues, and generally recovering from my messed up childhood. In the absence of my father, all his drama and manipulation, it had a positive effect on me. It would be the unfortunate death of a relative that would bring me back into contact, albeit briefly, with my dad. Once it became apparent I would be in the same room as my father at the funeral, old feelings started to resurface, namely anxiety. I discovered through my siblings that while I'd moved forward making positive changes in my life, my dad and his wife would regularly gossip about me, blaming me for ruining the family and all sorts of nonsense. My father was apparently actually afraid to talk to me after reading my big bad email. They made me out to be some sort of demonic force or something. We wound up on the phone, this being our most recent interaction. I can recall some better details because of this. I wanted to give him one last shot, and he effectively shit all over it. I took great care to remain calm during the call, asking him what was up with shit-talking me so much, if he'd read my email and thought about things at all. I got the usual, deflection, excuses, self-victimization, the whole bag... I stayed the course and put the conversation back on track every time he tried it. When his usual tricks didn't work, he resorted to staying silent in response to everything I said, then saying, Hello, hello, are you still there? As though I was supposed to respond to my own questions, I shut that down real quick too and told him to quit dodging me. Finally, we hit ground zero. You see, a verbal conversation with this man is like a game of Pac-Man. There's all kinds of distractions and some mean-ass ghosts to be sure, but if you practice, you can clear the level. Well, it turns out clearing that level with my dad led to this. In a dead tone, he said, Your mom is lucky. I asked how so. He explained if it weren't for us kids, he would have burned the house down with her inside. This was admittedly not a nice thing to say, but that's not even the worst of it. I told him I thought he was a psycho, and asked him to refrain from ever contacting me in the future, thus effectively nailing that coffin shut. When I relayed this information to my mother, she got real quiet. Then, she shared the shocking information that there were multiple occasions on which my father had prepared a separate meal for her at dinner. She became violently ill shortly after. There were other things, too. Times where she'd noticed that someone had been messing about with the gas fixtures in the home and whatnot freaky stuff that made her feel she was losing her grip on reality. Fast forward several years and I'd finally moved on. Living my own life, enjoying my marriage, my father-in-law was easily ten times the dad my biological father had ever been. 
My mom had largely recovered from him and was finally healthy and thriving. I was content, and it was a rare occasion on which my bio dad even crossed my mind momentarily. Despite my mom, brother, and I all being advised by various mental health professionals, friends, and family to cut contact with this man, my brother continued to seek out his acknowledgement, which broke my heart a little bit. There was one thing left, though. The stalking. When I was 12, my dad helped me open a checking account to piss my mom off because she didn't think I was ready for a debit card. Turns out, I still have this account, and my dad's still connected to it as well. He can't access the money or anything, he can only look. A while back, I tried looking into removing him from the account, which the bank informed me had to be done on his end, or I could make an appointment and do it in person. I've admittedly been lazy about this. It doesn't bother me all that much, as he can't really do anything other than stew on the information. The only times this affects me is when my brother goes to visit him. Every time without fail, my father will bring up something or other he learned from my bank account. I know my dad knows my brother will relay this information to me. On top of this, I occasionally get notifications from various profiles telling me he's viewed them. I haven't updated or checked them in years, so it's probably pretty boring stuff. I can only assume he's stalking me everywhere he can. What a creep. I'm not really sure what he gets out of this. I don't know if I'm supposed to be intimidated or what, but at this point, it's just funny to me. It's a little bit sad and rather pathetic even. Like the best he can do as a father is digitally stalking me and poring over my financial statements like he's trying to crack the Da Vinci Code. Dude, I'm 30 now, I work in the adult entertainment industry and you're literally no different than any of the other weird old guys gooning over me on the internet. By the way, to those of you who might be wondering why I'm so laid back about all of this, my rationale is that I refuse to give this guy an ounce of power over me. He's too childish to directly contact me, so as far as I'm concerned, he can die of ruminating over my latest toilet paper purchase or something. I'm not saying this works for everyone. It's just what works for me right now. When I was in high school, I was around 16 years old. I had a friend named Lisa and a second friend named Zoe. Lisa had a lot of money, and her huge house was located right next to our high school. This meant that basically every time we had a break or anything like that, the three of us would head over there. We would also have a lot of sleepovers at her house. It was this huge rich people house, so it was pretty awesome to get to stay there. One day, we decided to stay the night there, the three of us, plus Lisa's little sister, Anna. Their mother was gone for the night. We decided to put on some PJs and watch scary movies for hours. Anna went to bed before us three, and we stayed in the living room watching TV. At one point, the alarm went on. It happened sometimes. Lisa went to go turn it off, and that was about it. Only a short ten minutes later, the alarm suddenly went off again. This scared us because it was not supposed to go off that often. Technically, the alarm was made to ring only when humans came by, but because the house was located in the middle of the forest, we all knew that sometimes animals would wander by, and this had happened many times before. When the alarm was installed, we tried to calibrate it as much as possible for humans only. This was the second time it rang. We started to get a little bit scared. We went upstairs and opened the windows to look in the garden all around the house. We saw nothing. We even went on to the balcony in the middle of the night, but we still couldn't find anything. I was alone on the balcony at some point when the alarm went on again. The automatic lights around the swimming pool suddenly turned on. That meant something was in the pool and I was just above it. I got so scared, I got down on my knees and stayed there until my friend deactivated the alarm and the lights. I ran inside the house. At this point, we were really, really scared and started thinking about what it could possibly be that was setting the alarm off. If it was a human being, all our lights were on, so they must know where we were. We turned all the lights off, and all four of us went into hiding downstairs in the kitchen without taking our phones with us. 
I don't even know why not even one of us thought to bring them. There we were, lights off, scared in this huge house, with windows everywhere we could look. The alarm went berserk again. Anna screamed. Lisa took her with her, reassuring her while walking to shut the alarm off, like turn it off once and for all. I was there in the kitchen with Zoe only, and we were looking all around us. The alarm was upstairs, so the other two were quite far away from us. At some point, we could hear footsteps right beside us, right on the other side of the wall in the garden. It was fast, not scared, just fast, like this person knew exactly where they were going. We just froze, waiting in the dark, and jumped when something, well, someone, it was obvious, walked by the door right in front of us. He had a light with him, but it was another light that allowed us to see his silhouette, so there must have been at least two, running all around the house for about 20 to 30 minutes. This door was, like I said, a windowed door. We were still doing our best not to move so they wouldn't see us. The girls upstairs were so scared by the alarm that they froze there. At least, that's what they told us. Suddenly, we heard a voice. Then, a second one. I was unable to understand anything they were saying, but I could hear that they were talking. Zoe and I were blinded by a sudden light shining right at our faces. We were frozen, literally not able to move, scream, talk, not anything we could have done was possible, since we were stuck in fear. The light stayed there. Someone was seeing us through the blinds. Someone was watching us being scared and was just standing there. Suddenly, we heard a harsh sound on the front door, which was closed. Zoe didn't move at all, but I don't know what took over me. It just woke me up. I crawled over to the door in front of me, the back door. I closed the blinds and held the door in place, just in case the guy on the other side tried to force it. Honestly, I'm very small and thin. My little body was probably useless here, but I wanted to do what I could anyway. The one at the front door was still trying to break in, Zoe still not moving, the two girls upstairs doing I don't know what, and the one just in front of the glass window away from me started to hit it, trying to force it open. It was closed, but I grabbed the handle and hung in there for a while. He was just smacking at the door trying to open it. All of this lasted for hours in my head, but it must have been only a few seconds. Very abruptly, the hits at the front door stopped. A few seconds later, the ones in front of me stopped as well. Then the lights just kept zipping around everywhere. The alarm did nothing, so it must have been disabled as they'd wanted to do. After this, we were so scared that Zoe and I fell asleep in the kitchen, and the two sisters upstairs. Nothing happened for the rest of the night. It seemed it was all over. The next day, Lisa and Anna's mom came back home. We told her everything. We got yelled at a bit because we didn't call the cops. I took it the wrong way at the time, but I understand now why she got so upset. She called the cops instead, who went to see the house and discovered footsteps all around it, some muddy boot prints on the front door as well. That was about it. They told us it must have been some guys who were just doing some recon. You know, when they walk around the houses to see how to rob it. Apparently it was very common in this area, since there were a lot of really big and beautiful houses filled with expensive things. The only thing I'll never be able to explain is why they suddenly started being so aggressive. Originally, they were just walking around the house looking, but I think if they were trying to see something or just look things up, they would have left immediately when they realized we were inside, right? Or at least left when that guy saw us in the kitchen. Well, they didn't. Instead, the moment they saw us, they started being hyper-aggressive and trying to force the doors open to enter the house where we were. I don't know if they really wanted to rob the place. I never will. And honestly, I don't want to know what they wanted. I didn't spend any more nights at this house after. I was too scared they would come back again, so I could never fall asleep there. Lisa got a bit mad like she didn't understand. But from what she told Zoe and I, I guess she never saw the people. She just stayed upstairs with her sister. So I can understand why she doesn't understand how I feel. This happened during summer vacation when I was 11 years old. 
Me and my parents always go to South India for at least one month to visit our family. During the whole month of June, there is what we'll call in our little village the Mango Festival, or Mangani Festival. It's a religious festival where divinity statues are exhibited in big parades. There's also a large alley filled all along it with small temporary stands, where people can buy lots of different things, like street food, fruits, toys, clothes, and even more at very cheap prices. My mom and I always go to these little stores in the evening, at about 5 or 6, when it's already dark. Going during daytime is just too exhausting, with the unbearable heat plus the huge crowds. At that time, the alley is still very bright, enlightened by the stores and decorative lights. This day, my mom decided to stop at a shoe-slash-flip-flop stand to buy me some pairs. The seller proceeded to show my mom the collections. When he noticed my presence, though, he locked his eyes on me immediately. At the beginning, it didn't bother me very much. I just thought I might look like someone he knew or something, but he just kept staring at me the entire time. He knew exactly the right time to stare, too. Whenever my mom was looking at my direction, he would stop right away. Then when she looked away, he would start looking at me again. It was very obvious at this point, and it made me uncomfortable. Eventually, we had to leave without buying anything, but the seller insisted we come again tomorrow because he'd have a new shipment or whatever new collections were arriving. About two days after, my mom called me to go to the festival stands once again. I was reluctant to go with her this time. I told her I was genuinely tired and didn't want to go, but she yelled at me, saying I was always being lazy and wasting my summer vacation, staying at home all day. So I went with her. Our first stop was at the cheap jewelry store. Then my mom made me do something I always hated, but she would do all the time in order to help me with my shyness. Here, take my purse and go to the shoe stand by yourself. Buy a pair that you like. I'll be watching from here. I refused at first, but she progressively raised her voice. To avoid being humiliated in front of other kids, I did what she said. When the man saw me approaching his stand, he welcomed me with the most unsettling smile. He proceeded to show all of the new sandals as I was his only customer. He even took the time to put the sandals on me one by one, asking if they fit well. At this point, I just took whatever freaking shoes as quickly as possible to get out of there. Now was the time for the checkout. I was, and still am really, stressed to order or talk to a vendor. I used to stutter a lot during these social situations, but this time was completely different. It was not only stress, but there was also this underlying fear, this gut feeling, saying this man was too strange and I should not be here with him alone. I handed him the money and was waiting for my change. His demeanor suddenly completely changed. He became very fidgety and showed frustration over the cash register. He then said that it had broken for some unknown reason and would not open anymore. I glanced outside to see if my mom was still watching me. She was still observing. When we made eye contact, she made a gesture with her hand, telling me to hurry. She was observing at an angle, and as I was next to the cash register at the corner, I could not see her properly anymore. At the same time, the seller told me he had another register in his trailer. He then took my money and went inside. It was sort of an open shop so you could see his trailer if you were right in front of it. He went inside for a long time. I could hear the voices of other people inside. They were talking, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. For another ten minutes, I was just standing there, waiting awkwardly and peeking back at my mom occasionally to notify her of my presence at the checkout. Then another client entered the shop. She was looking at the merchandise when she asked me where the vendor was. I told her he was in the trailer. At the sound of our conversation, the vendor peeked out of the window and said to the woman, We don't take any more clients, ma'am. We're closing very soon. The woman left shortly thereafter. It seemed strange to me that he decided to close so suddenly and so early. It was only about 6 p.m., and usually everything closes around 8 or even late 9s. I couldn't leave yet, though. I still had to get my change back. The vendor peeked from his trailer window and said he'd finally managed to get my change. 
He then made a sign with his hand and told me to come inside. I was unsure about what he wanted, so instead I said nothing and waited there awkwardly. After a short moment, he peeked back out. You can come in now, you know. I was confused. Why couldn't he just come outside and give me my change back? Why the hell did he take so much time, too? I didn't say anything. Instead, I peeked outside to my mom. When she saw my concerned face, she decided to finally come and help me. Actually, I'm waiting for my mom to come. When my mother entered the shop, the seller left the trailer almost immediately and handed my change back right away. He didn't seem frustrated anymore. Instead, he was smiling and very talkative. He even asked my mom if we were from here, to which he responded that we were from France and spending a summer vacation in our hometown. My mom and I continued to go around to the other shops, but I could still see other clients coming into that shoe store, even though he just said he was going to close soon. By the time my mom finished her shopping, it was 8 p.m., and on our way back, I could still see the lights inside. When we got closer, I could even see he was using the same cash register that was supposedly broken. At that age, I didn't quite realize how creepy the whole thing was. It just seemed sort of odd and awkward. Years later, though, I finally realized that his gaze, his behavior, his touches were also wrong. That night, I bet his intentions were of the worst variety. Luckily, though, that was the last time I ever saw him. During the festival the following year, I couldn't find his stand anywhere. Instead, the slot was occupied by a street food stand. I apologize in advance since I'm not a very good writer, but I'll do my best to share my experience. To better paint the picture, here's a description of myself at the time of this incident, which was three years ago. I was 5'5", a 26-year-old woman, medium-length bleach blonde hair, curvy, 175 pounds, wearing black high-waisted tights and a pink crop top. Three years ago, I was walking home late at night from my friend's house. It was dark, and at the time, I lived in a rough part of a large city. Now, I've had many sketchy situations that I've gotten myself out of, so I guess I sort of felt invincible, like nothing truly scary could ever happen to me. After all, when I walk alone, I always stay very alert and aware of my surroundings, for my own safety, just in case. About halfway home and roughly 10 minutes from my apartment, I noticed a van had started tailing me. I was used to this since in my city. It's very common for a young woman in a rough area to get propositioned for sex. It's sort of embarrassing how desensitized to that sort of thing I was. I did my usual and crossed the road so that I would be walking beside the traffic heading in the other direction. I wasn't scared or anything, I was just really annoyed instead. The van then turned down a side street, then back onto the road I was on, and pulled up alongside me. At this point, I still wasn't scared yet. Again, this had happened to me so many times, it never even mattered if I was wearing something that showed skin or not. Even if I was wearing a winter coat zipped from just below my chin all the way down to my ankles, well, this area was just notorious for that type of activity. This time, I decided to be quite firm and told the person very sternly, I'm not interested. I noticed then that there were two men in the van. They looked almost identical to each other and may have actually been twins or even brothers. Both men had a very, very dark complexion, dark eyes and short, dark hair. The van didn't move away from me, though. I was super annoyed and crossed the road again to get away. At this point, I figured that would be enough for them to stop following me. Only, they didn't. They kept circling back every time I crossed the road. I had never had to put that much effort into getting a horny pervert to leave me alone. So this is when I started feeling unsafe. They zipped by me at the speed traffic was flowing in, and I yelled at them to fuck off. When they didn't come back for a while, I thought it had finally worked. It had been three minutes almost and I hadn't seen the van again, so I thought I must be in the clear. Just in case though, I pulled my phone out and started getting ready to call my sister who I lived with. Just then, 
The van pulled up right alongside me extremely quickly, and before I could even blink, one of them jumped out of the van. He shoved open the back door and approached me in an aggressive manner, as if he was about to scoop me up and throw me in there. The traffic in that area was very inconsistent. It was dead at this time, and I imagine that's exactly what they were waiting for. Just as the man was about to grab me, I tilted my phone and said this, You're being filmed in my live video chat. I gave my friend your license plate number, and the police have already been notified. I was so scared in that moment, but I never let it show. Instead, I stayed as calm as I possibly could. The man paused, as if he was considering whether I was bluffing or telling the truth. I tilted the phone a bit more, as to give the fake audience a better look at him. He jumped into the van, and they sped off right away. I've never been the same since that night. I'm afraid of walking alone now, even in the daytime. Stay safe out there. About 10 years ago, when I was still in my early 20s, I worked in a restaurant slash bar establishment that was primarily staffed by young females. Not hooters, but it was a similar concept. One especially slow afternoon, a few of us were hanging out in the office with one of our managers when the phone rang. She answered with a smile and cheerily recited our standard greeting before asking, How can I help you today? After a few seconds, though, the smile completely disappeared from her face. She asked in a startled tone, Excuse me? The panic in her voice caught the attention of the rest of us in the office, and we instantly shut up. We watched as she sat in open-mouthed silence, her face getting more and more pale before she wordlessly hung up. She turned to us and shakily said, We need to get everyone out, now. Apparently, when she'd answered... A man on the other end told her, You're all going to die, you bitches. That's when the excuse me was asked. Afterwards, he told her he was going to blow the entire place up because we were all horrible, stuck-up bitches. We collected the rest of the staff, needless to say, got the few customers who were present out as well, and all walked across the street to the movie theater where our manager called the police. A whole fleet of cops arrived. The building was searched for any sign of explosives. Statements were taken as well, and they stayed for several hours waiting for anyone to show up with bombs, which never happened. By the end of it, it was all declared a prank call. The police filed a report, though, and management decided to close for the rest of the night, just to be safe. One manager went back to check the caller ID, but whoever had done it had blocked the number right away. We were all on edge for our shifts for a few days afterward, but it eventually passed by and we thought that would be the end of it, until about a month later. I was on my shift when the phone rang. I answered, prepared to take it to go order, but as soon as the how can I help you left my lips, a string of profanity was screamed into my ear. He was just screaming incoherently at the top of his lungs into the phone. It was hard to make out exactly what he was saying. Something about how I was a stuck-up whore, a bitch, lots of F-bombs sprinkled in as well. The string of profanities lasted about 30 seconds. I was too startled, really, to hang up right away. Then, as abruptly as all the screaming had begun, the other end went silent, and he was now gone. I went to the manager and told him what happened. I was asked if he'd made any threats again. I said no, but for some reason... He was really, really mad at me in particular. The decision was made to not evacuate this time, since no threats had been made. This pattern continued until the establishment eventually went out of business two years later. One of us would pick up the phone to an angry berating of our character. Sometimes we wouldn't hear anything from him for a month or two. Other times he'd call every day for a week straight before suddenly disappearing again. Occasionally, he would call back to back for hours on end, too. Eventually, we all got able to laugh about it. A lucky girl who would get the call would hang up and say something like, Sorry, just my boyfriend calling to say how much he adores me. If a new hire answered and told us about it in shocked horror, we were just kind of like, Oh yeah, by the way, that's a thing that happens. You get used to it. The number was always blocked, and we never did find out who it was in the end. 
We decided at one point collectively it must have been a customer that got rejected by one of the girls or something and just didn't take it well. I don't travel much now, but when I was younger, my family traveled all the time. All of our relatives were concentrated around the Kentucky area. My parents were the only ones who decided to move away. They were also the ones who were always expected to do all of the traveling, too. Not having a lot of money, we rarely, if ever, would stay in a motel on these long drives. Instead, we very often would sleep in our cars. More often than not, we would park the car at a rest area or truck stop in order to try and get some sleep. Every once in a while, we'd do it on the side of the road, but that was a lot less common. You're more likely to get woken up by a police officer if you do that. This continued for basically all my life, even after my father passed away in my teenage years. After that, my mom, me, and my little brother would take all of the trips together, and I graduated up to the front seat. When I was 16 years old, we were taking this fairly short trip. It was really only about a 9-hour drive, I think. We left in the evening, though, so we could try and avoid rush hour traffic. Since my mom wasn't the type of person to alter her sleeping schedule at all, I knew we were not going to make the entire drive in one go. At about 1 a.m., my mom finally wasn't able to drive anymore. She told me to keep an eye out for a truck stop or a rest area. There was one right ahead of us, so we pulled into it. It was a rest area with a large back parking lot for truckers. There were a couple of semis already parked back there. We parked, but closer to the end of the lot. Nearly right away, my mom and my brother were both able to fall asleep. I wasn't like them, though. I had a really difficult time ever falling asleep in a car. If I wasn't laying down in a bed, on a couch, or even on the floor, I just could not drift off that easily. So I didn't even know if I was going to be able to sleep at all or not. As luck would have it, I wasn't able to sleep right away. We were at the far left end of the parking lot, so my window was facing the majority of the rest area. I laid my head against the window of the door and looked out over the lot. I kept staring at it, hoping I would eventually be able to fall asleep. I may have dozed off slightly once or twice, but if I did, it was really light. It seemed like I was awake the entire time. I was watching through the slightly foggy window for who knows how long. Every now and then, I'd see a person walking by, but there weren't very many at all. I watched one car pull up and park a bit away from us, but it did park near another car. A huge man got out and walked up to the car he had pulled up near. I watched as he pulled out a gun and suddenly shot through the window of that parked car. It was hard to process what I had seen at first. I just sat there in the car stunned looking at the scene. I didn't know what to do, but after what I saw, I knew I had to do something to protect my family. I tried waking my mom up. It was extremely difficult because she was a very deep sleeper but I finally managed to get her up. She wondered immediately why I was bothering her when she was trying to get some rest. I tried explaining to her what I had just seen. I think she was still a bit sleepy-headed, though, and had trouble processing what I was saying. She moved a bit and accidentally hit the horn on the steering wheel. It was only for a moment, but that was all that was needed. I looked back out the window at the attacker. To my horror, he had heard the honking, and he obviously knew it came from our car. I began begging and pleading with my mom to start the car and get the hell out of there. She kept on asking me what for, and after trying to tell her repeatedly, I finally told her to just look out the window. She did, and saw that man was quickly approaching our car. I told her I had just seen that guy attack another trucker, and now he was coming towards us. My mom quickly got the keys to the car and started it up. She pulled out of the parking lot as fast as possible and turned ready to make it to the exit of the rest area. The attacker noticed this and began moving across the lot in an attempt to block us from getting out. Fortunately, my mom had finally gotten her wits about her and was prepared for his move. She hit the gas and swerved easily around the guy and kept going. I looked back, and yeah, he did try to chase after us for a bit, 
but of course he wasn't going to be able to catch up to a car on foot. My mom got the car out of the parking lot and back onto the highway in no time at all. As soon as we were able to get to a telephone, we called the police and reported what I had seen. I could describe both the guy and the truck he was driving. It didn't take very long for the police officers to find and arrest him. After that, we stopped taking those midnight naps in rest areas and sprung for cheap motels from then on instead. I spent many, many years as a trucker. I'm a female, which is important to this story, I suppose. One thing I learned from driving back and forth across the country for decades is that you are always going to find something weird. I can't even tell you how many times I've looked down into a car that was passing me and saw someone getting oral sex or something like that, and that's just one of the more normal things I've seen. This time, I had been up driving for a really long time. I tried to stay awake for as long as I could. I think I had been up and on the road for a full 24 hours at that point. However, even with the help of coffee, my eyes were betraying me and becoming impossible to keep open. I absolutely didn't want to have an accident and harm any innocent people, so I decided to pull over at the very next stop that I saw. I came across a rest area very shortly after. I pulled my truck into it, and then into one of the truck parking spots. I wanted to go to sleep right away, but I needed to find a bathroom first. It was a very cold night when I got out. It was pretty late out too, but that doesn't always mean anything at a rest area. There are people around at all times of the day and night really, but this time there was no one outside but me. When I went into the rest area, there was no one in there but me either. Even though I was exhausted, I knew I shouldn't fall asleep right away. There was a coffee machine, and I got myself a hot chocolate from it, so it might do a bit to help me doze off. I remember it was in one of those cups that had a poker hand on it, and I'd gotten one with a full house. Not that I was playing anyone, so it's not like it really mattered. Anyway, I took a sip from my new hot chocolate and walked back out into the cold. I was not in a really huge hurry since I had been making good time already, this meant I could sleep as long as I really needed to. I got up to my truck, then stepped up on the sidebar in order to reach the door. However, as I did so, I noticed something that caused me to pause for just a moment. I had a sleeping compartment in my truck. I noticed that the curtain blocking it off on the front of the cab was now closed. That made me stop immediately, because I had never closed that curtain before. As I was standing there looking... I noticed something far scarier. Someone was peering out from behind the curtain. They quickly pulled away when I looked into the cab. I really didn't know what to do. Part of me thought I should just throw open the door and confront whoever had gotten into my truck. I immediately felt like an ass for leaving the door unlocked as I left, but I always did that. I decided it would be a better idea to get my butt back over to the rest area and call 911 instead. I jumped down and ran over and back into the rest area. I called 911 and told them what happened, and they sent the police over. I waited in the building for a while for the police to arrive. I watched the truck out of the window, but I hadn't been able to see it the entire time I was on the phone. I was worried that whoever the person in the truck was, they might have gotten out and come after me in that short time. Fortunately for me though, if they were still in there, I would be able to see anyone if they were coming up upon the building. A car did pull in at one point, and someone came into the rest area. I knew it was not the person who had been inside my truck. I warned them someone had broken in, and the police were coming right now, so they should be careful. Finally, after a while of waiting, the police arrived. Well, it was the highway patrol technically. I showed them which truck was mine. They went to check it out and came back after a little while. The trooper told me there wasn't anyone in the cab now. However, they believed me that someone had definitely broken in. Within the past week, a female trucker had been attacked in a similar way. She had been stabbed several times, but thankfully not killed by an intruder who had snuck up into her back compartment when she had left for the rest area. It was scary, and the main thing I thought about was when I almost confronted that intruder. I think no better choice has ever been made than me not doing that.
I got in my truck and drove for a while longer. The experience definitely caused me to completely wake up for a long while. I drove a long ways before I decided to stop again and sleep at that time. This time though, I made sure to lock the door. So, I had been talking to this guy online for a bit. He lived out west and I was more in the Midwest area. But after talking for a while, he invited me to come visit him for a few weeks. The only problem was, he lived in Nevada. The only time I could make the trip out, he was going to be visiting family in Colorado. So, we came up with a new idea. I would take the bus out to Colorado to see him, and we would drive together to his home in Nevada. He picked me up in a town in Colorado and drove us to Denver. He also had to go to Wyoming to visit another family member along the way. I went with him, although I found it weird he was bringing me together with him. Although we had talked a lot online and on the phone, his family had no idea who I was. They were very nice, but the whole thing was just very awkward. It wasn't until we began driving from Wyoming to Nevada that I finally began to be able to relax around him. We talked a bit and finally found comfort in person that we had experienced while we were online and over the phone. So, we started getting playful and joking together and stuff. I started trying to think of something I could dare him to do that might be pretty fun. We dared each other to do silly things before we had met all the time. So when I saw the sign for the rest stop, which he told me was the very last one until we arrived at his house, to be silly, I dared him to take off his clothes in the bathroom give them to me, and then streak out to the car. He thought that was absolutely hilarious and wanted to do it, so he agreed. I guess he'd done a lot of things like that with his fraternity in college, and it sort of made him feel a bit younger again. I don't have to go into the details of us setting this up, but he undressed in a stall, gave me his clothes, and I took them out to the car. I then waited for him to show up. A couple of guys actually went into the bathroom as I was leaving, so I was pretty sure he would wait for them to leave before he did the deed. I kept watching from his vehicle. The two guys who had come in were in there for an awfully long time, but after a while, they finally came out. They went over to their pickup truck and quickly drove away. I kept on waiting for Brian to come out of the rest area. It was pretty late at night and there were not many cars out on the highway that night, so no one else was stopping at the rest area. I mean, it was really weird. I got out of the car and walked toward the rest area. At first, I thought he may have chickened out and was still in the bathroom stall. I went into the bathroom and called out for Brian, but I couldn't find him anywhere in there. Confused, I kept looking throughout the entire area, trying to find him everywhere. I even checked in the woman's bathroom, thinking he might have gone in there to avoid the two big guys who had gone into the building. There was also a closet. It was unlocked and I checked it out too. And no, Brian was not there. I just couldn't find him at all. I began to get very, very concerned. Just what the hell could have happened to him? I completely searched the entire rest area, and he was nowhere to be seen. I was really scared, because now I was in the middle of nowhere in a place I had never been before, and the one person I was with who knew the area was suddenly gone and not able to be found. I didn't know what to do. I was concerned as fuck for Brian, too, because I wouldn't have got him naked if I didn't like him, you know? It was a nightmare, and I had no idea what to do. Disturbed and wondering if those two guys had done something to him, I decided I needed to go check on the car. As I walked out to it, I found him lying inside. He had sneaked out the other entrance and crept back to it. The two guys had actually found him naked, beat him up, and threw him into the girl's room. I think he crept out and went to the car when I was in the boys' room. I know this story has a normal ending and doesn't seem very scary, but I was absolutely terrified when it happened. About a month or two ago, my girlfriend and I went out to our favorite bar. The drive was a tad bit longer than an hour to our place from the bar primarily on barren interstate after the first 15 minutes, save for a few rural exits and one rest stop a little over halfway home. 
My girlfriend was sober that night and was driving. I had had a bit to drink and was feeling quite warm and tipsy. I asked my girlfriend to make a quick stop at the rest area so I could go and have a pee. Thanks, beer. This is a normal stop for us to make if one of us had been drinking for the night, since the rest area had its own direct exit and entrance. It was faster than taking an actual exit into town for a gas station. The rest area had only one road in and out, and was surrounded by trees to the point you couldn't even see the facility from the freeway. It also had wooded walking trails along the side. By the time I hopped out of the car at the rest stop, it was sometime around 3 a.m. As mentioned, this is a fairly regular stop. Until that day, the only other person I had ever seen in that rest stop around that time of night was the guy who maintained the place. I walked in. The vending area was empty and completely silent. I made my way over to the men's room and pushed it open, only to be immediately startled by an old man maybe in his mid-sixties or so, standing immediately to the left of the door inside the bathroom. He was wearing what I can only describe as an Inspector Gadget coat and slacks. I noticed he had a cell phone in his hand as well when I opened the door, but it was hanging down at his side and the screen was not lit up at all. He stared directly at me, and I stared back for a split second. Then I got over it and passed him to head over to the urinals. I took the urinal closest to the sinks, when I noticed he made no indication he was going to walk out at all. It was basically a wall of mirrors stretched out far enough that I could watch him the entire time I was at the urinal. I unzipped my pants and did my best to keep my eyes on the mirror without turning my head at all. By the time I looked into the mirror, his phone was up in his hand and on as if he were texting, but he seemed to be staring intently at me rather than the phone. Either way, he was definitely not looking at whatever was on the screen. A very long 60 seconds passed by like this. I absolutely could not piss with this silent guy staring at my back from beside the door. Then, in the mirror, I noticed him start to take small, slow steps towards me. I tried to tell myself I was just tipsy and imagining it, to get on with my piss and get the fuck out. Then he took a more obvious step forward. I put it back in my pants while I sped walked to the back handicap stall and locked the door. I went to the back where my feet weren't visible anymore and texted my girlfriend about this creepy guy inside with me. I sat and waited to hear the door open signaling him leaving, but it still didn't. After possibly the longest eight minutes of my life, I finally heard the door open and close. I had to wait another full two minutes before I could finally pee in the stall. I cracked the stall door open a bit. Luckily, the bathroom was not huge, and I had almost complete visibility of the room from the stall I had picked. I saw no signs of anyone else, so I walked out, washed my hands, and beelined it back to the parking lot. I finally made it back to the car and asked my girlfriend what car that old guy had gotten into. She turned to me with wide eyes and said, He never got into a car. He just walked across the parking lot and went into the tree line. With the rest stop being the only thing on the very short on-off ramps and the other closest civilization being five miles away by interstate, I have no idea where the guy was going. Later on, I also realized, although the rest area main room is small, there is a secondary entrance and exit on the side that goes to a patio backing up directly into the woods. I forgot about it because I basically never use it. If that guy had somehow managed to get the jump on me, though, he could have easily pulled me out of that door, and my girlfriend would have been none the wiser. I don't know if that was his plan and I ruined it when I made my dash for the stall, but regardless, I hope I never meet that old man creeping in the rest stop bathroom in the wee hours again. This happened when I was in high school, which was a long time ago. My mom actually just recently found the paperwork about it when she cleaned out her office upon retiring from the police department. I remember being very upset and scared when it happened, but reading the details as an adult, it sounded even worse than what I remembered. 
I was 17 at the time and was female, working at a flower and gift shop. It was around nighttime when this man came in. Short, overweight, balding, 40s. Very creepy as well. He told me about how he needed an apology gift for his girlfriend. So I offer a bouquet, obviously. It's a flower shop after all. He then says though that she doesn't like flowers because they die so easily. This was the first weird thing. If that was the case, then why would he come into a flower shop? Then he starts going into detail about how he hit her and asked me if I thought he was right to do so. This was so long ago, I don't remember exactly why he smacked her around. I do remember saying something along the lines of, not if you want her to continue being your girlfriend. He then told me what a great job I was doing and asked when I get off work. I dodged his answer and he left right away. Nothing else happened for about six months. Then, right before Valentine's Day, he burst into the door one minute before closing. It was pretty dark and from outside it looked like I must be working alone as my only co-worker, about 40 and female, was away in the bathroom. Instinctively, it felt like a predator had just entered the room. You know that feeling you get when something isn't quite right? I felt that pretty much right away. I then noticed he had a tarnished revolver tucked into the front of his windbreaker, which was halfway unzipped already. It was obvious he wanted it to be seen. I quickly scribbled the note to my co-worker, that said he has a gun. I handed it to her right away when she came out of the bathroom. She calmly walked to the phone and looked at me, wordlessly asking if she should call the cops. I shook my head no, as I felt like it would only escalate the situation. God forbid he heard the police coming or something and took us all hostage. I was just going to try and act calm and normal as I could. Hopefully, the situation would not tip into something more dangerous. He spent about 15 minutes wandering around in what was really a fairly small shop. In retrospect, I think he was probably waiting to see if my coworker would leave, as it was now well past closing. Finally, he placed an order for pickup on Valentine's Day. He gave me his name and info for it. I made sure to file that away for the police report I was sure as hell about to put in. He bought a card and pulled out a wad of $100 bills which he slowly thumbed through as if looking for the exact right one with which to pay for his $40 order. I asked him if he wanted a bag, as it wouldn't be very inconspicuous if he just showed up at home with a Valentine's Day card. No, I don't really feel like being inconspicuous tonight. It seemed like an obvious reference to the gun barely hiding in his coat. He left and we quickly locked the door behind him, and watched him just sit in his truck outside. We were not about to exit the shop until he was gone. After a little while, he pulled out of his parking spot, making it look like he was going to leave, only to move to another spot slightly further away and continue to sit there. I don't know how long we waited, but after even longer, he finally left. I called my mom after crying. She called the police, who came to the shop the next day to take a report. I told my best friend at the time what happened too, and she told her mother. Her mother happened to work with the man and informed security at her job. She said he was known to be very weird, creepy, and liked to talk about weapons a lot. Security at his job, it's a large company with government contracts and things having to do with tech and security, pulled him into the office later and questioned him about the incident. He claimed it was a glove in his pocket, not a revolver. The police were pissed that his company made contact with him about it before they did, and he successfully managed to dodge the cops' multiple calls and visits to his apartment. My mom, much to my teen fury at the time, made me quit that job, which was devastating as I really loved working there. In retrospect though, it was totally the right call. The dude did come in on Valentine's Day and picked up his order without any problem, and after that I never saw him again. This is very long, so I apologize. I don't really know how to be concise with these sorts of things. 
It was Halloween night, stereotypical, I know. Several years ago, I was followed home by a stranger. I worked at a large mall about an hour away from my home. The stores closed at 10 p.m., and the only bus home ran every hour and only dropped me off two-thirds of the way there. I would have to walk the rest by myself. This usually happened between 11 to 1 a.m. at night, depending on if I could get the store closed down on time and if the bus wasn't too packed for me to get on. I'm not a small woman by any means. I'm actually fairly tall and fairly round, and I wouldn't say I'm particularly attractive. My uniform was just a polo shirt and black trousers, some flat shoes as well, all covered with a very thick coat. I didn't see him get on the bus. To be fair, that day the bus was packed, and noisy as well. The walkways were crowded over. I did my best to just block it all out with my headphones, and stared out the window. I was never a people person in the first place, and having been at work for 12 hours on a very busy day surrounded by some of these same assholes, I was just pissed off and desperate to get off that bus and be home. When we finally arrived to my stop, I somehow managed to struggle my way to the front of the bus, through all of the people that refused to move. I stumbled out into the night air and breathed a heavy sigh of relief. A couple of other people got off the bus behind me. I started my climb up the hill, crossing the road to continue up the side street that led to my road. This side street was very long and had offshoots into several residential streets on very steep hills going downward. The street itself was lined with various small shops. It was also a high grassy bank on the opposite side that had houses dotting the top of it. It felt very isolated after the shops closed. Very few people would ever get off my bus stop at this time of night, and even fewer still would ever head in the same direction as I did. Those that did tended to cut off and go down one of those other hills, long before I got to the one that led to my building. Now, the street wasn't very well lit at all. The street lamps were few and far between. Several of them were also motion-activated, so they wouldn't even turn on until you were basically right on top of them. I walked home in the dark this way a thousand times before. I also walked to work this way as well, at 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning, a thousand times too, for a different job albeit. I always enjoyed the cool night air, and I was not afraid of the dark. I actually loved how bright the stars were where I lived, and I didn't tend to loiter either. I walked fast so I could get home and shower ASAP. This night, though, I noticed that someone was still walking behind me. I usually do notice things like that because, as I stated before, very few people walk this way at this time of night. I was very aware of him and waiting for him to eventually turn down one of the side streets. But he never did. It felt a little weird, but I'm not the only person that lives in that area. Maybe he was just someone that wasn't regularly walking this way at this time of night, so I just never encountered him before. I get to the medical surgery and car park at the bottom of my hill and cut across it same as always. At this point, I know that if he also heads the same way, I need to start worrying a lot more. This hill goes alongside the surgery, and then there are high walls on my side of the street that block off all the flats on the other side from my road. They can only be accessed from the road before mine. At the top of the hill, this wall ends and turns into an alley that runs parallel to my building. The opposite side of the road has multiple closed pubs, a closed corner store, and an old church that had been converted into a Muslim worship center, which is also now closed. There were even less street lamps in this area, and my building was surrounded by a tall metal fence with 20 or so feet of grass that sloped down to the entrance of my building, where the doorway was the only point lit up. My point being with this description that it was very isolated, and the only reason someone should ever be up there at this time of night is if they lived in the same building I did. This guy crossed the car park right after me, and now I started feeling very concerned. I knew for a fact that he did not live in my building, there are nine flats over three floors, and only ten people. I know all of them, and they know me as well. 
we would recognize each other, even in this level of darkness. I start walking faster up the hill, hoping to get to the building before he can manage to catch up. He starts catching pace with me. I can hear him gaining on me. By the time I make it to the gate, I knew he was too close for me to be able to open the door and get inside before he was already on me. The building was already dark. I knew everyone was in bed by now. I felt completely alone, and at this point I was basically shitting myself. Thinking quickly, I crossed the road and walked further up the hill behind some parked cars. I used the opportunity to swing my backpack off one shoulder and grab my keys. I waited for him to follow me and get behind the cars too. I figured it would take just a little longer for him to be able to cross back over before I bolted across the road and threw open the gate. I swung it hard behind me because he was now running full at me. I thought it would either latch before he could catch it or it would smack him. Either way, it would buy me a few seconds. I slid down the slope, barely managing to stay on my feet. It was dangerously slippery when wet. I turned the corner at the bottom and slammed my keycard on the reader, pressing hard on the heavy door before it beeps so it will open just that much faster. The door was heavy and also on fire safety hinges, which meant I couldn't slam it shut or force it closed. The stairs were a couple of steps into the building and to the left. I lived on the top floor. It was not exactly a big building. Three flats on each floor, two flights of stairs. I get inside the building and immediately bolt up the stairs. I was only a few steps up when the door flew open behind me and the guy came running in after me. Feeling a little more secure now that I'm in my building and only a few feet away from my neighbors, I spin around before he can reach me and slam my heavy backpack into him. He fell back to the landing and barely managed to catch himself by grabbing hold of the handrail. I screamed at him, What the fuck? at the top of my lungs and held my bag in front of me. Now we were inside. The stairwell was lit up by the motion activated lights. I got my first proper look at him. He was a little bit taller than me. I'm five foot eight. He was black and old enough to be graying as well. His clothes were weird, made out of a weird waxy material some weatherproof jackets are. He was also wearing heavy boots. I didn't recognize his face at all. He looked up at me with these wild eyes as I stared down at him. I was fully prepared to kick him in the face and throw my bag if I had to. I didn't want him to be able to follow me into my flat, so I stared him down. At this point, he began to stutter, hands ringing over the handrail and ducking his head just a little, trying to look pathetic and harmless. He muttered something about visiting his son, like I stated before. Nine other people than me live in this building. At that time, none of them were black, and none of them other than myself were young enough for him to be their parent. Besides, even if his son did live here, how would he know to follow me off the bus to get to my building? Why did he follow me when I moved away from it? And why did he chase me so hard? He could have just walked up and buzzed up to his son to let him in, if this was true. I began screaming at him to get the hell out, repeating those words over and over, sprinkling in an occasional I don't know you and you don't live here. He continued muttering, making his excuses, but I shouted over him. I heard my neighbors moving around and coming towards their doors, probably to look through their peepholes as I began to back up the stairs. The neighbor right at the bottom of the stairs behind the man opened her door, leaving her chain on and peering through it at us. She asked me if I was okay and if she needed to call the police. The guy spun around instantly to stare at her, his hands out in a stop motion. I heard another neighbor open his door behind the stairs, also on the ground floor. He called out to ask if I was okay too. I just yelled out to both of them. This guy followed me home. I don't know who he is and he won't leave. I was now at the top of the first set of stairs looking down on him. My male neighbor started yelling at him to get the fuck out, either more intimidated by the man than he was of me, or realizing he was now outnumbered, he began trying to fumble open the door. You have to press a particular button to get it to open, and he clearly did not know this, further evidence he'd never been here before. Feeling more secure now that I was not alone, and that he was trying to escape, I bolted across the landing and up the final flight of stairs. 
I shoved my door open before locking it behind me. I was dripping with sweat and very close to a panic attack. I dragged my Hoover to the front door and propped it up. Just in case someone tried to force it open, I would hear it fall. I didn't sleep very well that night, though. I was awoken by every sound in the building. Luckily, I didn't have to work the next day, though. I woke up at about 6 a.m. to a lot of sound in the building's landings. I could hear people opening every bin chute room and coming back out again. I peered through my peephole to see uniformed policemen searching the common areas of the building. I hadn't called the police, but I assume one of my neighbors downstairs did. The bin rooms are fairly large, so I imagine they were checking to see if he was hiding somewhere. I don't know for sure, and I never asked. Other than asking me if I was okay when we saw each other next, the neighbors that helped on that night never said anything else about it. I don't know who he was or what he wanted. I've never seen him again after, and I stopped working at that shopping center a couple of years ago. I do feel guilty for not calling the police just in case he'd done this before or since and the woman didn't manage to get away. But at the time, I just wanted to forget all about it and move forward with my life. This happened in 2008 when I was 9 years old. I lived in a town home community where each road had two sides of homes. In between the backs of the houses, there was a back road with alleyways that went in between each building section. I lived on the edge of one of these, and my town home was on one of the alleyways. I lived on one street, and across the back road on the opposite side lived this elderly woman whose name I never even knew. I'm not exactly sure what her situation was, but I do know that for whatever reason, she really disliked me specifically. She was very creepy. She had spray-painted all of her windows so no one could ever see into her house. However, that never stopped her from sometimes staring out her bedroom window directly into mine, keeping it open at night to shine a red strobe light into my room across the way. She even used to randomly yell out how much she hated us. I was in the fourth grade at this time. On a particular January morning, I had unfortunately missed the bus to school. My dad sent me outside to get in the car so he could drive me. He said he'd be following me out shortly after. As I was walking to my dad's car, though, that old woman spontaneously came out of the alleyway right next to my house, slowly. I could see she had a gigantic kitchen knife behind her back. She raised it above her head and started bolting after me. Thankfully, I was faster than her, so I was able to avoid her and able to get back into the house. She walked and stood on the neighbor's porch across the way and stared at my house with a knife in her hand. I was terrified. My dad ran out and yelled at her. She said she wanted to get rid of us stupid kids. My parents called the police, but the police only sent her home and had an ambulance pick her up later. My parents went to some kind of court meeting about it, but I don't really understand the details. I didn't see her again for a while after that, until about one year later. I don't remember the exact day, but it had snowed that morning, so I was going to run out the front door and play a bit in the snow. I opened the door to see her standing on the porch, looking out towards the road. I panicked, closed, and locked the door. I ran up to my parents' room and told them what happened. We saw her walk off the porch and up the street. I never saw her again after that. My family has since moved far away from there, but people I know say she still lives there, and her windows are still the same spray-painted ones. Even though it doesn't affect me quite as much as it used to, I still don't like being around knives because of this. When I was younger, somewhere between 5 or 8 years old, a distant family member who was supposedly well-loved died. One of his last wishes was for the final celebration of his life to take place at his childhood home. His son, DJ, decided to respect these wishes and contacted the current owner of the house to ask if a small gathering could be hosted on the premises, entirely outside, of course. 
As far as DJ and everyone else could tell, the homeowner was kind and understanding, and agreed, offering even to help us out. Being clear on boundaries and such, though. Fast forward to the event itself. My whole family was arriving. I'd say around 3 in the afternoon. I still had this horrible, anxious feeling deep in my stomach that I couldn't quite shake. I mentioned it to my mom, saying something silly that I probably heard on the TV about my gut feeling. My parents shrugged it off, of course, and told me it's fine, and to come on. At that age, I trusted my parents' judgment completely. So I stepped out of the car, all dressed in a cute dress and layered in cheap plastic jewelry, think Mardi Gras beads, that I proudly chose myself to appear formal for this serious occasion. My mom, my dad, and I all walked toward the backyard, aiming towards the right-hand side of the house, as the inside was off-limits due to it being private property. At this very moment, a man burst out of the front door, holding a bat firmly in his hands. This was not a normal baseball bat intended to just occupy children either. No, this man burst out of his front door screaming at everyone, talking about how horrible we all are and how our family was disgusting, all while gripping a beat-up old bat full of nails. Immediately, I panicked. My fight or flight, in this case flight, kicked in. I made a beeline to our old blue car I'd only just got dragged out of by my dad. I jumped in and slammed the door behind me, panicking with tear-blurred vision and an incredibly upset stomach. I turned to look out the window, only to see that man, the crazy man who made the quick decision to target an elementary age little girl as he took a swing right at the car and hit the area above the back tire, creating a loud ring and a big dent. My dad, who took what felt like five hours but was probably more around ten seconds, shoved the man away and jumped in, my mom following quickly behind. We sped away from the house and back home, not mentioning a thing except for how proud of me they were for running. They also told me they'd listen to me if I ever had that horrible gut feeling that something was wrong ever again, though both my mom and dad kept shooting quick glances behind the car and whispering to one another. My family really never discussed this event with me around again, but when I asked my mom what happened years later, she explained that the man had decided to do a Google search on DJ and found his estranged criminal brother's records on Google. He decided this was enough evidence to attack our family during a wake with a nailed baseball bat. I dog sit for a family friend. They much prefer to have someone stay at the house with the dogs. I grew up in a town in the middle of nowhere, and I love the countryside myself. So, for me, this is sort of like a staycation. I live in the city now and never really have any time to myself. Anyway, their house is smack dab in the middle of nowhere. When I say nowhere, I mean this place takes two hours to get to from my work and is 45 minutes to the nearest town or interstate. There's one neighbor within five miles, and he lives directly across the street. I'm used to this where I'm from. It's supposed to give you the space you need, but also help you feel a bit safer knowing you have at least one person nearby in case something happens. In this case, however, this guy had done nothing but make me feel unsafe as hell. So, I get to Terry and Johnny's house this time, and they're telling me the drill. When to feed the dogs, two super cute spoiled Australian cattle dogs by the way, when to water the plants, all that housekeeping stuff. As they're loading up their last of their things to take them to the car, Terry says this, Hey, don't forget to tell her about Steve. John says, Oh, uh, yeah, don't worry about the neighbor across the street, he's pretty harmless. The guy drinks a lot and is a little bit off, but he's totally harmless. Hell, the guy lost his license so many times, all he can even do is drive a moped to get to town. He laughed and then stopped smiling. However, just in case something happens, this is where we keep the gun. He took me to his gun safe and explained that the gun was loaded, and if I were to use it for any reason, I did not need to cock it. Just pulled the trigger extra hard. At this point, I wasn't too sketched out. 
Whatever, you keep a gun in your house when it takes police at least 45 minutes to arrive to your home. Still, I've got no worries since I'm used to drunk weirdos. I know how to handle them by now. I was pretty in love with this life in the middle of nowhere. I also had two very protective dogs that would attack with a one-word command, so I was definitely feeling pretty safe. Terry and Johnny left at around 3 p.m. I took the dogs out for a walk and to play some frisbee, and began to unload my things while they were still worn out from all the running around. As I came back out for my second load of things, I was staying there for a week and needed work clothes in my Xbox to keep myself entertained in the evenings. I heard their neighbor Steve slam his door and seemingly having a phone conversation. I first just heard his voice very faintly. Then he suddenly yelled, Where did you fucking go? The dogs were hearing him now and starting to growl softly. I tried to calm them down. Easy boys, it's alright, it's just Steve, remember? He probably wants some privacy. Let's go inside. As I grabbed my things though, I heard him spontaneously outburst again. I do care about my kids. Fuck you! I then heard him throw something on the unpaved road behind me. Turned out to be a cell phone. As I was grabbing my stuff, the dogs started going absolutely crazy and ran a few feet behind me, barking and growling viciously. I dropped my things and turned around only to see the neighbor at the end of the driveway, 75 feet away, staring at me. I yelled at the dogs to calm down and get back to my side. I then gave a friendly wave to Steve. In my head, I was thinking, this is sort of weird, but he's probably been drinking. Plus, they said the guy is harmless. I've dog sat before and never had a problem with the neighbors. He took a single step forward and said in this weird sounding voice, You alright? Steve was wearing dirty jeans, work boots, and a red hoodie. A red hat with a confederate flag on it too. He had dirty brown hair to his shoulders and a beard that was about five inches long. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. My name is Pip, by the way. Just dog sitting for Johnny and Terry this week. I'm ready to get in and call an evening with the boys. I looked down at the dogs to see their reaction. They looked like they were about to attack the guy. I'd never seen them acting like this before. Uh, how about yourself? We sat in silence for a solid 30 seconds before he stated, I'm asking if you're alright. I'm Steve. Well, uh, nice to meet you, Steve. Thanks for being a good neighbor and checking, but like I said, I'm good. Are you alright? You seem a bit off. Again, silence. The silence lasted for an entire minute while he just stared at me. He's wasted. I should just get inside with my shit. I turned around and finished grabbing my things. As I did, I heard him step further up the gravel driveway. The dog started barking again. I know them, you know. Them dogs won't do nothing to me. They're some damn good dogs, that's for sure. I began feeling a bit uneasy. I closed my trunk and turned around to see if he wanted to say anything else. I was about to tell him I was just going to go inside. I started to awkwardly say something when he immediately cut me off. Yeah, what? I was shocked. Uh, I'm going to go inside now. Thanks for checking in again, Steve. I'm fine. I'll only be here this week, so have a good night. I turned around and the dogs followed me in with no problems. Steve continued to stand there where I left him for 10 minutes just staring at the house. As a side note, this house did not have a front door. There was instead a side door and a back door. The back door was the main door because the front of the house had those big green fluffy privacy trees. You couldn't even see his house through the front window. He couldn't see either doors from the street. You'd have to come fully onto the property to see them. At this point, it was about 6 o'clock. Where I'm at, the sun starts going down around that time, but it doesn't actually get pitch black until around 9.15pm during the summer. Anyway, the dogs and I were sat on the couch. I've got my gaming headphones jammed on while playing Red Dead Redemption 2 online. All of a sudden, the dogs just start flipping their shit. Running towards the back door, barking and growling. At this point, I was thinking, what the fuck? They never do that unless someone pulls up in their car, and they don't know who it is. I'm not having anyone over. I grabbed my knife, which was always close by, 
and started walking toward the back door. The dogs were still going crazy, and I had no idea what they were barking at. I couldn't see anything, but then I looked a tiny bit closer. I could just barely see moped taillights in the driveway, seemingly hiding behind my car. I tried to focus in and saw that Steve was turned around staring at the back of the house from his moped, hiding behind my car. I got the dogs to be quiet and hid to see what he was going to do. The dogs were still growling, but at least they were not giving away my location right now. I watched him for five minutes, no movement at all, just a creepy stare in my general direction. I didn't think he could see me yet, but I was not entirely sure. He then shut off his moped and crouched down next to my car, where I could see him peeking through my car windows. I didn't ever see him try to get into it, but he did walk around it multiple times. At this point, he was not even crouching anymore. Obviously, he felt like no one was watching him or gave a shit that he was looking into my car. He then took a single step forward and stopped looking inside, then gazed at the house. Then he repeated this, a single step every time. It was the creepiest thing. At this point, I texted Terry and told her that Steve was doing some weird shit. I told her I was starting to feel uncomfortable. I got a text back saying, Call the cops if you feel unsafe. They already know him. They can uh, come talk to him a bit. Remind me to tell you about the time he was standing out by the tree at 6am when I was leaving for work when we get back. I think he had a psychotic break or something. How comforting, right? I try to talk myself down some. This guy is just wasted. However, if he starts getting close to the door, I'm calling the cops right away. It was a dumb idea looking back because the cops take forever to get out to a place like that. I was watching him as he made a second round looking into my car. He then got on his moped and drove off into the night. As he passed the window that faced the driveway, he sped up, trying to make it so I wouldn't see him if I were just watching TV or something. Fast forward to 8pm. The dogs start going crazy again. I look out and now his moped is parked in plain view. He's just standing on the walkway 30 feet from the house, staring into it and talking to himself. I had previously turned all the lights off, so he couldn't easily see in and see what I was doing. I watched him take these weird single steps towards the door, now 29 feet away. At this point, I grabbed the gun. I'd calmed the dogs down and they were in full-on protective mode. One dog to my left and one to my right. It was about 8.15 now, and I finally called the cops. I explained the situation, and that the owners think he had had a psychotic break. As I'm halfway through explaining why I'm starting to fear for my safety, the operator says, Sorry ma'am, what's your address again? I tell her the address. Oh, uh, ma'am, I'm sorry, but you're not located in our county. I'll have to transfer you to another one. Are you serious? The owner said the cops here know him very well and know how to handle him. Isn't that you guys? Yes, ma'am, that is us, but you're located in a different county that's not our jurisdiction. The guy who's bothering me lives in your county. That's why I'm calling you. The operator then transferred me. The new one answered the phone with the average, 911, what's your emergency? I was silent. I was looking out the kitchen window. Steve had come up about four to five feet since the last time I'd looked out there. I then explained what was happening, and explained I was transferred because I was apparently not in their jurisdiction. She then told me to remain calm and turn all the lights on. She told me this would be the safest way, so I turned on the lights, and he immediately noticed. He turned and got on his moped and drove back to his house. I told her what happened after that. She asked if I would still like to have an officer come out. I asked her if she could stay on the line until he got here or not. She said that a cop was on its way already, but she needed to be available if anyone else called in. She told me if he came back, and I was still uneasy, to call them again without hesitation. Now, it was around 9. The sun had set completely. Again, the dogs suddenly go crazy. Now, I'm getting a bit pissed off. I walk around the house with a loaded gun, so that if Steve sees me, he sees that I'm packing too. I looked out the window and saw his moped, but this time I couldn't see him anywhere. What the fuck? Where is he? 
from the window in the kitchen, I couldn't see the back door at all, so I go upstairs and peek down through the bathroom window. I see Steve on the back porch lighting matches and throwing them onto the wooden porch. He didn't seem so harmless anymore. He was talking to himself, twisting his head back and forth like he was getting warmed up to have a fight or have a conversation with another personality or something. I started filming him from the upstairs window, just in case he killed me or something, you know? I could hide the phone and when they found it, they'd know it had to be this fucking guy. The sun was down. He stepped up to the door and started knocking. Then he began pounding. I'm pretty good at staying calm in situations, but my heart started beating so fast that my Fitbit had to change my heart rate tab every two seconds. I thought if he got in here, I was going to have to kill him or he was going to kill me. I could see pure hate in his eyes. He stopped pounding at the door suddenly though, quickly turned away, and ran to his moped. He started it and took off faster than I ever believed a moped could go. Not even a full minute later, the cop finally pulled into the driveway. I had mentioned to the dispatch operator that I have two dogs who would bark at the officer, but would not attack unless given a specific word. They were trained, and I did have a firearm. I left the firearm inside and went to meet with the officer. When I met with them, the dogs didn't growl at all. They simply gave a single bark a piece to let me know someone was there. I went outside to meet him and told him the guy had just taken off on his moped. Oh, yeah, I think I just passed him when I turned onto the road. I explained that he was absolutely drunk or crazy, and if he saw him on his way back, he should definitely pull him over, because I was quite positive he was under the influence of something. Normal people just don't act that way. The cop, though, shrugged everything off. Are you gonna stay the night here? I told him no, I'd leave the dogs overnight and come back in the morning. I asked him to stay while I packed everything up. He nodded. I went inside, gave the dogs love and treats, and crated them for the night. I took off and returned the next day with my dad. My dad began walking the perimeter to show Steve that a man was also staying here as well. I'm 24 years old, if you're wondering. Then Steve, wearing the same dirty outfit and hat, while holding a 24 case of Budweiser, began standing at the end of the driveway again. I was watching him from the front window. I could see my dad at the other end of the yard. As soon as he came into view, Steve turned around and walked back to his house. I later learned that Steve had been to jail multiple times due to domestic abuse. His kids were also not allowed to see him due to his violent nature. He had also bought a bunch of four-wheelers or something. No one seemed to know how he got his money to get these things. Gary and Johnny had never seen him leave for work. They'd only ever seen him leave on his moped or four-wheeler empty-handed for an hour or two, then suddenly return with a case of beer. I don't know who he thought I was, but every time he looked at that house in my direction, there was this pure hatred in his eyes. Who knows what would have happened if I hadn't called the cops as early as I did. I first met my stalker when I was in middle school. My school consisted of 7th grade through 12th grade and had a normal program and an accelerated program, with the students in each being pretty segregated. My friends and I belonged to the accelerated program, but there was one guy in the group from the normal program, Carson. All in all, we were a pretty typical group of teenagers, with Carson being the group's resident prankster. We could only hang out at school because we were all shipped in from various parts of the county for the accelerated program. So, after school, we would all hop on AOL to chat and play games together. Online, we had even more friends, as we'd invite our own local friends to also chat with everyone else. One day, Carson invited his friend Steve to join the chat. He was nice and contributed a lot to our conversations, actually. We learned that Steve actually attended our school too, but he was in the normal program and had a different lunch period than the rest of us. We had almost no chance of crossing paths. We did insist on meeting him, however, and scheduled for Steve to come to my locker before first period. That next morning, we waited, but Steve never came. My friend and I did have a short exchange with another kid named Marco, 
which consisted of us telling him to go away. Marco had been Carson's satellite since the beginning of the year. Wherever Carson went, Marco would stand ten feet away just watching all of us. We had tried at first to be friends with him, but he was simply too strange for us. He would touch your face unexpectedly, or sneak up behind you to bite you, or tell you he wanted to see you inside out. His list of strained behaviors became a mile long. Well, of course, a few days after Steve failed to come meet us, it came to light that Steve was really Marco, and that whole thing was one of Carson's pranks. Considering Marco had actually been a pleasant addition to the chat as Steve, we decided to give him another chance to join the real group. Besides Carson, I was the only person who really gave Marco a chance. He still did all the weird things he had always been doing, but now it was apparent that it was all an act to get attention for being the weird guy. Marco, it seemed, was being abused at home by his mom's boyfriend. He barely saw his mom because she worked so much. He was basically the poster child for bad attention is still attention. Still, my friends wanted him out of the group. I repeatedly found myself arguing his case to let him stay. I even once caught an older student beating Marco up as well. Being much larger than either of us, he was literally just picking Marco up and slamming him into lockers while he called him a freak. Knowing the bully and his mother, I did my signature move at the time. I kicked him in the balls while threatening to tattle to his parents about how he was treating me and my friends. I believe this moment was the catalyst for years of future torment, as after this, Marco became my satellite. At school, Marco would follow me around any chance he got. At home, he would message me non-stop, typically in the private chat, as my other friends wanted nothing to do with him. I felt really bad because he seemed like a sweet kid, you know, aside from attention-seeking stunts, and I thought no one should really have to go through life with no friends. Eventually, Marco did ask me out, which I politely declined. He was my friend, of course, but he was not the type of guy I would ever be interested in dating. He was very persistent, though, begging me to give him a chance. Over and over again, I would have to tell him no. Well, one day, his approach suddenly changed. You will go out with me, or I'll show your mom all of our chat logs. There was nothing especially bad in those logs. It wasn't like I was drinking or doing drugs or anything, but I was severely depressed at the time and sometimes talked about wanting to kill myself. If my parents ever saw that, I could kiss my freedom and privacy goodbye. I tried to bluff him. I told him good luck with any attempts to convince my parents to believe him over me, which seemed to work. I wasn't very impressed with this stunt and stopped talking to him shortly thereafter. A few weeks went by and Marco came crawling back begging for forgiveness. I eventually caved in, allowing him back into the group. At first, he was well behaved again, but slowly he started pestering me to become his girlfriend once more. Over the entire course of high school, he tried many different methods. Begging, blackmailing, attacking my self-esteem, trying to catfish me, threatening any guys I liked, threatening suicide, and much more. I tried to be nice at first, but eventually I had to get very mean in how I told him no. His behavior would reach a boiling point that forced me to cut him out of our friend group. I soon learned that once he'd latched on, it was nearly impossible to actually get rid of him, however. Online, he would create dozens of new accounts to send messages from, overwhelming any attempts to block him. He would call my phone all night long and leave woeful messages about how lonely he was and how he would kill himself if I stopped being his friend. Then he started showing up at my house and standing outside my bedroom window at random times. When my parents had parties, like the 4th of July, Thanksgiving, etc., he would somehow always manage to sneak in and show up. Their parties were pretty big with an open-door policy, so he'd typically wear a disguise and slip in after someone else. He'd then ultimately do something to get thrown out, like getting belligerently drunk or stuffing his face with food and then spitting it back out onto the serving platters. The first time I really felt Marco might actually be a threat, though, was at one of my parents' Halloween parties after we had turned 16. 
One of my dad's friends had a son our age, Tim, that was a bit of a jerk. He fancied himself a very cool guy and thought it would be fun to pick a fight with the weird kid to make a display of his superior strength. Well, Marco accepted this challenge. We all knew he was about to get the crap kicked out of him, though. Going out into the streets, Tim just towered over Marco. That year, Marco was dressed as Alex from A Clockwork Orange, his favorite book, with his costume including a cane. He swung the cane at Tim and smacked him in the head with it. Tim went down quickly after that. Marco continued to beat him on the ground until an adult finally intervened and sent him home. Marco's go-to threat whenever I had a boyfriend had always been, I'll beat him to death with a shovel and use it to bury his body. Suddenly, that threat seemed like something he'd really be capable of. Our senior year in high school, Marco's dad died in prison. He learned the real reason his dad had been there was for murdering someone. He'd always thought his dad was in for drugs. After this, Marco started to spiral out of control. He would always say things like his dad had been a murderer, so he was doomed to be a murderer too. He dropped out of school halfway through that year. My brother told me that after I'd left home to go to college, Marco came to the house looking for me multiple times. Once he figured out I wasn't there, he'd just come and stand in the front yard aimlessly, playing with a Bic lighter until someone threatened to call the police. One of my biggest worries was that he'd try to set the house on fire in some weird way trying to punish me. When I'd go home with my boyfriend, he'd always show up at my parents' house immediately after. At one point, he even tried to intimidate my boyfriend into breaking up with me by showing him his big hunting knife. It was always this big ordeal trying to get him to leave. After a while, though, a lot of the issues eased up just due to the sheer distance and time involved. I didn't use social media anymore, and I was able to semi-block people on my phone. It's weird, I can see when a blocked number tries to call me, but it doesn't ring. I still receive voicemails and text messages, though. I can't receive pictures, though. Initially, he was calling and texting every day, hundreds of messages. I tried asking him to stop, but this only encouraged him further. My family no longer lived in that area so now I was significantly less worried for their safety. I found the most successful way of dealing with Marco was to simply ignore him. Eventually, after a while of ghosting, his messages dwindled down to once a week, then once a month. Now, I maybe hear from him officially once a year or so. His message is typically always something along the lines of, Please just be my friend. I won't try for anything anymore. I need you in my life. The last time I actually talked to him, it was about four or five years ago now. Marco tried to tell me I'd ruined his life. He told me I'd put some spell on him, and he just couldn't move forward without me. He told me he would kill himself and it would be all my fault. Finally, I just had to tell him I wouldn't care even if he did. In fact, it would be quite a relief for me. His most recent MO is to call my work phone from a private number just to hear me answer then immediately hang up. He also calls and texts my brother, our high school friends, my brother's best friend, my parents, my grandparents, my aunt, and even my husband to beg them to ask me to call him. He even messaged my husband, tell her she's my angel, the love of my life. I'm nothing without her. I worry he'll snap someday and show up at my house or my job to kill me. I have security systems and other means of protection but I still get very paranoid about it. I've talked to the police about getting a restraining order, but they told me there's no real grounds unless he does start showing up and threatening to kill me. So I guess we'll see what happens. This is by far the weirdest experience I've ever had. When I was six years old, I had a neighborhood friend named Trevor, who was way older than me, like six years older. I always thought of him like the older brother I never had. My sister was about his age, but she always thought he was weird, so she never hung out with him. In fact, I realized no one in the neighborhood really liked to be around him, but for some reason I did. 
Maybe it was because I just felt bad he had no friends, or maybe it was the fact he treated me so nicely, like his actual little sister. I would always tell him, you're like the brother I wish I always had. He'd always reply, we're more than that. At first, I thought he meant best friends, but it turned out he meant something even more. About a year later, my sister and I moved my mom to my grandparents' house because my parents were struggling with their marriage and needed to take a bit of a break. That break lasted for about two whole years until my parents finally decided things were okay between them and moved back into my old house. When I returned, most of the kids I knew from the neighborhood were gone, but there was one familiar face I recognized, Trevor. I remembered being so excited to see him. I ran up to hug him, but he placed his hand in front of himself as if to halt me. I stopped and felt confused. I thought maybe he didn't recognize me, because I was 10 years old now. I was much taller and my hair was much longer as well. I began telling him it was me and I was finally back. I had missed him so much. He looked at me with anger blasted on his face though. Why did you leave me? I don't know if things can ever be the same again. I tried explaining to him what had happened, but he would always interrupt me. You're a bad liar, you know. I know you ran off with someone else. I was even more confused and promised him I never had. At the time, I didn't really think too much weird about it. I was so young, I didn't really understand what he meant. I just really wanted my close friend back. He wouldn't talk to me for days after, until he finally forgave me. We continued on with our adventures and played together just like old times. But there were some things that did change. Trevor was now a freshman in high school. He would always be bringing up stuff he learned from his health class, specifically male and female anatomy. He would show me pictures of a penis or a vagina from his textbook and teach me about them. I kind of knew what they were, but I had no idea what they looked like. No offense, men, but I thought a penis was the most disgusting thing I'd ever seen. I would tell him I didn't want him showing me these kinds of things anymore, but he would always just say I needed to learn for later on. Eventually, he would begin telling me about intercourse and how it was done. I was really getting annoyed at this point and let him know that by raising my voice at him. He eventually stopped schooling me about these things and things went back to normal like nothing had ever happened. Fast forward two years now. I was 12 years old and now in sixth grade. I felt so mature and like a woman now that I had hit puberty finally. I made a lot of new friends, but they were mostly just school friends. I would always come home to see Trevor, who was now 17. I was beginning to notice how strange he was when he kept wanting to play house with me. I didn't want to because I felt too mature to play childish games with him anymore. He would always beg and beg me though to play one last time, so I finally gave in. He started by asking me if I had started my menstrual cycle yet, and since we knew each other for so long, I was comfortable with him and told him yes. He would continue to ask me strange questions. If I had pubic hair, what size bra I wore, I would fake laugh it off and tell him he was being too nosy. We were about to play our usual house games when he decided to suddenly change things up by pretending that we were a couple about to get married. He made us dress up in formal attire and literally did everything that happened at a real wedding. He even made fake rings to go along with it and sealed our marriage with a peck on the cheek. Whenever I tried to take the ring off, he would get extremely mad and tell me it was a gift and it would be rude of me to not wear it every day. I kept the ring on around him, but I would take it off whenever I wasn't. Months went by and I continued to notice how much weirder Trevor was. I noticed especially how much more sexual he would become. I even had to ask him to leave my 13th birthday party because how sexual he was acting with my other friends. He would constantly tell them I was his wife and we had rings to prove it. I would tell them it was just our friendship ring, which he would always be very irritated by. Months later, I came home from school and was surprised to discover a bouquet of flowers with a card on top of my dresser. The card read something like this. Happy anniversary! I can't believe it's been a year already. Yours truly, Trevor. 
I was so annoyed that even after all this time, he was still playing out this we're married fantasy. I was mad at my parents for letting him into my room without permission, too. My parents, though, told me they'd never let him into my room. In fact, they'd never even seen him come. I was extremely creeped out. After that incident, I would try my best to avoid Trevor and tell him I always had a lot of homework to do. When we did hang out, he would make me feel extremely uncomfortable. He would always try to make me feel guilty about not getting him an anniversary gift. I got even more creeped out when he'd say things like, You know, we never really got to finish our wedding yet. We still have our honeymoon left. His creepiness eventually got to the point where he would call me at ungodly hours in the night to tell me how much he appreciated me, or even just to say hello. I ended up ignoring his calls and put my phone on silence. Once I started doing that, he would literally just show up at my bedroom window and tap on it until I would wake up in the dead of night. My sister would sometimes see her and tell him to go away if he didn't want her to call the cops. He stopped coming, or at least I thought he did. Eventually, I started to notice that things in my room would not be the way they had been before. For example, I'd noticed my bed covers were messed up when I knew for a fact I'd made it well before I left for school. Decorations in my room would be placed in different locations or would vanish altogether. At first, I blamed my sister for these things, but she swore up and down it was not her. Things got even stranger with Trevor, and I no longer enjoyed his presence anymore. One day, though, everything changed. I never saw him again. It was like he had just suddenly vanished from the world. One day he was a creep, and the next day he was just completely gone. I asked my parents if they knew where he was. They said he had left to go live with his uncle or something in Illinois. I was relieved to know he was finally out of my life. As the years passed by and I graduated high school, I still never saw Trevor. I would sometimes see his mom outside, but she would never make eye contact with me. In fact, I noticed she would always look kind of nervous whenever she saw me. I had never really known Trevor's mom. She would always be in her room when I would go to their house. I could barely even get a full sentence out of her. Trevor would always say she was just super shy. I visited home for a summer after finishing my first year of college. I was extremely happy to be home in my old room, which was basically a guest room now that I was gone. I was going through some of my old stuff my mom had packed into boxes when I noticed that old ring Trevor had given me. I picked it up and showed it to my mom, telling her about the odd time Trevor made me marry him. How weird it was he had left without even ever saying goodbye while he was mad at me for leaving all those years ago. He was such a hypocrite. When I mentioned him, though, there was a very severe look of concern apparent on my mom's face. I asked her what was wrong. She told me the truth about what happened to Trevor. Apparently, one night while we were all asleep, my father woke up to some noise. He waved it off as my sister, or just me using the restroom or something, and tried to go back to sleep. Then he began hearing a different set of noises, something like someone crying. He thought one of us was having a nightmare and got up to go check on us. He went to my sister when he noticed the sound was coming from my bedroom. He was using his cell phone as a light. When he was close enough to see my whole room, what he saw shocked and angered him. There, in all of his naked glory, was Trevor staring down at me as I slept. Those weren't cries my dad heard. They were moans from Trevor. My dad said what the fuck and marched into my room. Trevor heard him and ran out immediately. By this time my mom was awake because she wanted to know what was going on. My dad told her to stay inside while he was going to Trevor's house to beat the life out of him. Of course he didn't in the end. His mom begged him not to and said that it wasn't his fault. He had some sort of mental illness. Apparently, Trevor kept repeating he and I were married, and he was just trying to consummate that marriage. Of course, that really sickened and pissed my dad off. My dad threatened him by saying if he ever saw his face again, he would kill him. From that day on, we never saw him. To this day, I still don't know where he went. Hopefully, his mom got him some help, because he definitely needed it after what I experienced and from what my mom told me. It gives me the shivers and really disturbs me.
About 25 years ago, while I was still in middle school around 7th grade, I had this real bad problem with bullies. I couldn't handle the ridiculing I took while riding the school bus, so I started walking 3 miles to and from school every day. The path I walked was actually pretty safe. It was mostly on a sidewalk and always on a fairly busy road, with the last 2.5 miles being a straight shot directly to the school. Back then, there wasn't a stigma attached to kids being outside on their own. This wasn't deemed unsafe or noticed by anyone, or so I thought at least. I lived alone with my father, my parents being divorced. My mother saw me on the weekends. My father didn't see any harm in the walking, and my mother wasn't even aware of the bullying or the walking either. I didn't want her to know, actually. So I continued to do this unimpeded for over a half of the school year. I wasn't exactly an active kid. I for sure didn't like having to walk six miles every day to school, so I assume that was the motivation for the error I was about to make. One day, on that long six-mile way home, a car pulled up on the shoulder and stopped, just 100 feet ahead of me. Immediately I thought, hey, that car looks familiar. It must be my father. He's going to drive me the rest of the way today. That's great. I started to jog up to this car, seeing him in the driver's seat waiting patiently. And then I noticed something. Huh? His hair looks darker than normal today. Wait, wasn't the inside of his car tan, not red? The thoughts left as soon as they entered. I caught up to the car and opened the passenger side door and started to get in. As I was tossing my backpack on the floor in front of me and swinging my legs into the car, I started to say, Thanks, Dad. But the sentence never finished. Before I knew it, I had shut the car door and begun to move. This isn't my father. The man was much older, by at least 20 years, hair obviously dyed black, and hands propped at 10 and 2 on the steering wheel. Even the shirt he was wearing looked just like the one my father would have worn, a short-sleeved collared button-down, brick red with black horizontal lines, not pressed but not too wrinkled either. He was smiling at me, which probably would have felt warm if it was coming from someone like my grandfather, but instead this man's smile felt menacing. I heard a click and looked over at the door, which had just been locked. I stared at the door for a moment longer, then turned to face the front, completely frozen, terrified. What am I supposed to do now? Hello. I saw you walking and I figured I'd come give you a lift. I didn't move or answer. Don't act scared, just act normal. His voice matched his smile, deceivingly friendly. We were roughly a mile away from my home and only half a mile from the next turn needed to head that direction. All I could do was concentrate on exactly how I was going to get out of this situation. Stay calm, don't act scared. Are you on your way home, perhaps? This snapped me a little out of my zone. Home, yes, I want to go home, I answered. Stay calm, talk normally, don't act scared. I repeated these to myself. Where's your house? I can take you there. Feeling just slightly relieved, I told him to take the next turn. I felt myself begin to breathe and realized how tense I had been. My body relaxed slightly, and I finally moved and wrapped my hands around my backpack straps. See, things are fine. Keep calm and you'll get home just fine, I kept telling myself. We started to come upon the intersection. I pointed ahead, reiterating that this was my turn. Okay, but, uh, if you want, we could take a ride instead. It sounded like a question, but it didn't feel like one. The dotted line for the turn lane had already begun, but he did not move over. I instantly tensed back up, and my grip and my gaze on the backpack straps tightened. Through strained muscles, I choked out that no, I really needed to get back home. He swung the car into the turn lane, and began to make the turn. Wide-eyed, I glanced up and verified that, yes, we indeed were making the turn now. Are you sure? I'll make sure you get home before anyone realizes you were gone. 
Rip tightening further, I abruptly stated that I needed to get home right now because my father was expecting me. He was already waiting. I hoped it sounded more convincing to him than it sounded to me. We completed the turn seamlessly. <sighs> okay, well, maybe next time. I'd like to meet you at the same place tomorrow if that's okay. Sure, yes, tomorrow, tomorrow is good. Always tomorrow. Tomorrow is far away. I just need to get home today, right now. Maybe it was actually convincing the way I answered him. My eyes were firmly trained on the road ahead of us, hoping that if I just focused on the direction to home, I would get there without trouble. The turn into my neighborhood was fast approaching, and I informed him again pointing to the direction, the direction straight home. The next moments were silent, even if everything was loud in my head. As we came upon the turn, I reminded him, and to my slight surprise and incredible relief, he actually made the turn. For the first time, I had more hope than doubt. Oh damn, I can't let him know where I live. What should I... You know, it's probably not a good idea that I drop you off right in front of your house. Your dad might see me, you know, and get mad that a man gave you a ride home. Then we wouldn't be able to meet tomorrow. I was able to appreciate the good fortune of my silent question immediately being answered for me. My old neighborhood consisted of mainly apartments, but in the back there were a block of townhouses, which is where I lived. If you were unaware of the layout of the complex, those townhouses might go completely unnoticed. Right before we got to the area where I lived, I told him to stop right there. He pulled over to the side of the road in front of an apartment building. He unlocked the car door and I hurried out, backpack still clutched firmly in hand. I began to close the car door behind me. I'll see you here tomorrow then? Same time? I paused for a second and risked another look at the man. Still smiling, still terrifying. Yeah, tomorrow. See you later. I finished closing the door and hurried off. I tried my best not to run. I swung my backpack on the right way and briskly walked in the opposite direction of my house. I could hear the car idling behind me. It wasn't until I was able to turn off that road and leave his view that I finally heard him start to move away. He had to drive up to where I was walking to turn around. I glanced back as he was making an awkward turn instead of going around the block to leave. He caught my gaze and gave a slight wave before driving off. My hand was in the reluctant process of waving back, but I was slow enough that he was gone before I even completed the motion. I turned my head and kept walking. The moment I could no longer hear his car, I ran as fast as my pudgy legs and heavy backpack would let me. I ran around to where I could hide between two buildings and stayed there for a while, until I felt enough time had passed for me to feel confident he was not just driving around waiting to look for me. It was probably 30 minutes, but it felt like hours at the time. I ran the rest of the way home, keeping a lookout and making sure he couldn't see me going through the backyards. I reached my front door, unlocked it and almost spilled inside I was moving so fast. It wasn't until I locked the door behind me that I finally felt safe. I didn't feel scared anymore. I was finally home, and I couldn't believe I'd made it. In the end, I told both of my parents. My mother forced my father to drive and pick me up from school for the remainder of the school year, and luckily for me, the bullying stopped next year as well. My father didn't believe me though, and thought I made up the story to get out of walking to school. In his defense, me trying to explain that no, the car was exactly like yours, and no, he did look like you, just with darker hair, was kind of unbelievable. It didn't matter, really. It was worth his disbelief and annoyance every day in the car, so I never had to meet with that guy ever again. This happened back when I was in fourth grade. It's always stuck out to me as odd, but once I became an adult, it dawned on me just how dangerous this really was. I had just been invited to a friend's birthday party, which was to be held at a popular pizza joint that had a bunch of arcade games and things like that. This pizza place was right next door to a small movie theater. The movie Titanic had just come out so there was a decent amount of people in this part of the shopping center. My mom had to run some errands and pick up one of my other brothers, so 
so she dropped me off along the way there. She said she was going to stay until others arrived for the party, but I knew she had a lot to do. The place was familiar to me as well, and I knew my friends were already either inside or would be there very shortly. I told her to just drop me off, and I went inside by myself. My mom had also arranged a ride home for me from one of my friend's parents. No one had gotten there yet, so I had to look around at all the different games. I then went outside the restaurant to wait for my friends to show up. There were actually a lot of people outside the theater, lined up and waiting to get an early entry for the evening showing of the Titanic. And that's when I noticed a couple, a guy and a girl, standing by a car smoking cigarettes and staring over at me. A good chunk of time had passed, about 20 minutes or so. I was super confused as to why my friends hadn't shown up yet. I knew for a fact that this was the right place, and I had showed up at the right time as well. I was going over all the reasons why they might be late, when the cigarette-smoking couple came over to me and started to initiate a conversation. They asked me what or who I was waiting for. Now obviously at first I was very hesitant to talk to these strangers, but they looked to be about my oldest brother's age, late teens or early twenties, so I wasn't feeling too bashful or shy around them, at least conversationally. I explained to them that I was waiting for my friends to show up for a group birthday party, but they hadn't shown up yet and they were all running pretty late. The couple made some other small talk, told me they were waiting to see Titanic, but when they showed up all the tickets had already sold out for the showing they wanted. They just decided to hang out until the next showing which they had successfully gotten tickets for. After a little while longer of waiting and talking with this couple, they asked if I was hungry. I said I was and they offered to buy me some pizza to share. As a hungry kid who was seriously looking forward to pizza, but was unsure if the party was even still going to happen, it wasn't an offer I could afford to pass up. We went inside and ordered and sat down together. I actually ended up hanging out with this couple for a really long time. They were being super nice to me, gave me money for arcade games, bought me as much pizza and soda as I wanted. I had almost completely forgotten about my friends and the party that was supposed to happen, until I saw what time it was. Almost two hours had passed by. I started to get pretty nervous and anxious. I wasn't sure exactly how I was going to get home now. I didn't have a cell phone on me since it was 1997, and neither did my parents. My mom was going to be furious that A, no one had even showed up to the party, and B, that I didn't seek out help from the restaurant or some kind of security guard or police officer. Also C, I'd spent the last two hours with some strangers accepting food and money from them. I decided to ask this couple what I should do. This is where things started to get very strange. The guy just turned to me and said flatly, You don't need to go home. Thinking back, I definitely couldn't comprehend the weight of what he'd just said. I didn't know what to say in response to this, so I just kind of shrugged in confusion. I told them I needed to find a phone. I went up to the counter and asked if they could help me. I called home, but nobody seemed to be able to answer. I tried again and again, but still nothing. I then told the people at the counter that I was trying to get picked up but no one was answering the phone at home. I must have looked pretty panicked because just then the guy from the couple came over and put his hand on my shoulder. Don't worry, we'll figure this out together. He then gave me some more money to play a few more arcade games while he figured it out with the guys behind the counter. I had no idea what they talked about specifically but I ended up playing another game then went back to the table we were at. The guy came back over and said that now they were going to take me home. He was being super positive and upbeat about it as well, insisting it was no trouble whatsoever. His girlfriend was also being very insistent of the idea. A part of me was still super hesitant because I was taught stranger danger and all of that. But the bigger part of me wanted to believe it was really all innocent. I was really grateful after all that these people had been so nice to me fed me and kept me entertained. They had even missed their movie to stay with me. I told them I wanted to try calling home a few more times before leaving. So over the next 15 to 30 minutes, I tried calling everyone a bunch, but there were no answers at all. I decided it would be best to say yes to these people 
and have them take me home. Again, I was very young, impressionable, and naive, and had never been in a situation like that before. The people behind the counter, though, must have been seeing this from the more rational side. They realized something seriously fishy was going on. It turned out, in the meantime, one of them had gone on break to go call the police to come over and address the situation. The policeman showed up and came over to figure out what was going on. I don't remember everything about the conversation, but it ended up coming down to who was going to take me home. The couple was being oddly insistent. Thinking about this now as an adult, I find it kind of strange that the cop was even considering letting this whole thing be an option. As an adult, there's no question in my mind the cop should have shut that conversation down immediately and taken me home himself. But for some reason, they as a group decided to let me decide. I felt like I was being extremely pressured. I remember going back and forth in my mind. These people had been so nice to me and had hung out with me all day. I didn't want to be rude, but I also felt really intimidated by the police officer. I remember this part specifically as if it were yesterday. As I was thinking over what to do, the cop left to talk to some of the guys behind the counter. Immediately, as soon as he was away, the man from the couple looked at me with this big, broad smile and asked me this. Do you want to go with him, or do you want to go with us? I told him I would go with them in that moment. Again, in hindsight, I can't believe the cop let this happen. As we were getting our things to go, the police officer suggested that if they were going to take me home... He was going to follow us the entire way there, which I guess was a redemptive assurance. The officer asked for my address and my parents' names as well, just to be sure. I got in the couple's car and told them where I lived. We started on our way. The girl was driving and the guy was in the front passenger seat. The entire drive there, the guy was just looking over his shoulder at the back window, glancing back and forth between me and the cop following us. We pulled up to my house and I went up to the front door, while both the couple and the cop parked out on the street. I opened the door and went inside, and saw my mom looking out the window with a very confused and concerned look on her face. She went outside, found out all that had happened, and was immediately furious. I didn't tell her the specific things the couple had said to me. Again, I really didn't understand the gravity of the situation until years later. Going through the whole scenario in my head, if the cop hadn't followed us, I more than likely would have never been seen again. Thinking all the things they had done and said, befriending me, feeding me, giving me money. This was obviously them totally trying to come across as disarming, trusting, and friendly. A totally fucked up situation that could have been so much worse. It's really kind of hard to think about. I'm almost 30 now and have kids of my own and thinking about them in this situation makes my blood boil over. Also, the reason why my friends never showed up and the party never happened was because they had to cancel for an emergency in the last minute, and they weren't able to call to let me know. So there's that, I guess. This is a true story about my life that began roughly four years ago, when I just turned 16. I've been weighing on whether or not I should post this even, because I'm a little afraid the person in this story will somehow see it and know it's me writing about them. Nevertheless, here I am. The minute I turned 16, I knew I wanted to get a job. The first one I was able to get was a restaurant job. It wasn't exactly fast food, but it also wasn't a full-service restaurant. It was somewhere in between the two. I was a cashier and was actually very, very, very shy. This is important to note, as some things that I'll talk about later continually happened because of how I was resistant in speaking up. Now, I'd say I was about halfway through my first year or so at the restaurant when Chris was first hired. My first impression of him was that he was extremely tall, extremely loud, and kind of a charismatic teddy bear type person. This was also the impression he gave the rest of the staff as well, and the impression that remained with them the entire time he worked there. Honestly, I don't fully remember the first encounter I had with him. Again, I was very shy and I just really wanted to do my job in peace. 
All I really recall is that my manager was talking with him and introduced me as one of the only high schoolers on the staff, and someone she thought was quite funny. I remember him saying something about how he was going to make me tell him a few jokes to see, but I don't remember anything after that. In the beginning, it just seemed like he was suddenly so stuck to me. What I do remember, though, is the hugs. Chris was certainly a big hugger. He liked to hug every girl on the staff when he first arrived, and also when he was about to leave. I would feel very uncomfortable by this, because not only did I hate being touched by a man I didn't know, but he was also a man nearing 30 years old, whenever he would come over to me. I would always find myself something to busy myself with in a corner, so he couldn't easily touch me. When he did end up catching me off guard and getting me into a hug, he would really linger and rub my lower back. No one else around me seemed to care or be uncomfortable by the constant hugs though. This was a large factor in me feeling like I was overreacting. There was a time I went in on my day off to put a request off in the office. I talked with one of my managers in the front for a few minutes, when suddenly she heard someone talking over the headset to her. She looked over at me and smiled. Chris sees you and wants you to wait until he's finished in the back so he can give you a big hug. I couldn't control my grimace and told her I was going to leave right away. She laughed and I heard her say over the headset how I was running away as I walked out the door. For the next couple of weeks, Chris refused to speak to me, but I could feel him staring all the time. It was at least a nice break from all the hug attempts. Eventually, he got over it though and continued like nothing had ever happened. Another particular hug I remember is when we were both alone in the back. I had walked back there to retrieve something, and Chris was the only other person there. Usually, the dishwashers or the manager or another server would be there too. It almost made me stumble a step, and I briefly hesitated. He'd always made me nervous to talk to with others around, and now that we were alone, I knew he would start some sort of conversation inevitably. He saw me stumble and laughed and told me to come in. The entire conversation is a bit of a blur, but I remember him asking me how I was feeling that day. I responded with some sort of dumb joke like, oh, you know, good, kind of dead inside. I thought he would laugh it off and we would just move on. Instead, he immediately went in for a hug. I maneuvered as best as I could into a side hug and patted his back. As I did, I felt his other hand press against my lower stomach and slowly start rubbing in a circle. He leaned down into my ear and whispered, It's okay. Chris will make it all better. I remember going white in the face and fake laughing, backing right out of there. The entire exchange took less than 15 seconds, but it completely destroyed my mood for the rest of my shift. Although this was definitely the most inappropriate interaction I'd had with him so far, I still did not say a thing to anyone. The next thing I remember is the singing. Chris was, I believe, around 28 years old and also a college dropout. His dream was to become a famous singer. He would always sing to customers, in the back kitchen and dish room. He most definitely sang to me. He'd make up songs about this high school girl and walk back and forth by my station singing at what seemed like an insane volume. I would always cringe into my register and try to talk over his voice to the customers. I think the songs were when I really understood that although he was very touchy with everyone else, he seemed especially interested in me. Every time we worked a shift together or even saw each other, I say this as he was always in the restaurant even when he wasn't working. Seriously, every day it was like he lived there. He would ask me to come over to his apartment after work. He would talk about how he wanted to show me some new thing he put in or just bought or how he was going to throw a game night with the rest of the staff. He would also seem very upset when I said I couldn't because of school in the morning or that my mom didn't want me to as the rest of the staff were already college age students. There's even one time in particular I remember where I went to IHOP with the rest of the staff after a shift because it was the first time I had ever worked up the courage and felt comfortable enough to hang out with them outside of work. Chris was there, but I barely spoke with him and sat on the other side of the table. When I got up to use the bathroom and walked out after I was finished, Chris was there waiting for me. I think he had pretended to need to go to the bathroom also, but had waited until I walked out. It was nearing when we were leaving. 
He grabbed my arm and asked if I would ride with him back to the restaurant, where the rest of our cars were, instead of who I'd come with. I quickly brushed past him and jokingly said I thought my co-worker might be offended by that. I ran back to our table before he could respond. Although all of these things made me very uncomfortable, I didn't truly feel a bit of fear until movie night. This happened quite later into my time at the restaurant, after I had made a couple of actual friends there. Two girls that were around my age and I had become fairly close at this point, and decided that after their shifts on Friday night, I would come pick them up and we'd go see a movie at the mall close by. We laughed and talked and generally had a really good time together. I remember really enjoying the movie all the way through to the end. However, when it did end and we all filed out, one of them looked briefly behind her, then stopped in her tracks. We both whipped our heads around immediately when she called out in a confused voice, Chris? It was then when I saw him, kind of embarrassed and half hiding behind the staircase. He walked over and laughed. Wow, it's so crazy, you guys are here too! We then told him to wait a minute while we had to go to the bathroom. After rushing in, we looked at each other with the widest eyes. I started stumbling with my words, and then they filled me in. They said he had been there during their shift earlier, and overheard them talking about how I was going to pick them up for a movie. He asked which movie, and they told him. They said he didn't even say anything else. They might have been lying, I guess, but it really would not take a genius to figure out the location and time if he knew which movie it was, although I could tell it weirded them out a bit. I was by far the most uncomfortable. They tried to calm me down by saying things like, Oh, you know, he just has a little crush on you. He probably just knew you were going to be there and wanted to come see you. This did not calm me down at all, though. They ended up deciding to go to McDonald's together afterwards. I faked that I wasn't feeling good and just had him take them while I went home. I'm sure I didn't fool anyone, though. I remember seeing his car everywhere I went, even though I knew he lived in the next town over. It was a car I remember very well, as whenever I had a shift. I would always check the parking lot to see if it was there to prepare myself. Although I don't want to say exactly how, it was definitely very distinct and identifiable. I saw it rushing past me at the mall. I would see it outside of my local grocery store. I would even see it briefly slowly leaving my neighborhood. Every time I felt this rush of anxiety, but again, I never said a thing to anyone. One of the final things that happened when he still worked there was at my high school graduation. As I said before, I was the only one of the high school students out of a staff of about 40 people. Definitely the only high schooler at my specific school, to be sure. I was close to a select few at my work, but not close enough that I thought anyone should come or be invited to my graduation, especially because it was over an hour away, and that's a lot to just randomly ask of someone. The only people that knew where and when it was were the friends that were graduating with me and my family. The afternoon went on and I had a fairly great time. After the ceremony was over, everyone was to leave the building and find their friends and family outside in the lot. We were arranged by last name, so I had to wander a bit while calling my mom in order for us to find each other. That was when I saw Chris. He was leaning against the side of the building, looking around intensely. Although he could have possibly been there for someone else, I knew in my heart he was looking for me. I quickly walked back into the middle of the crowd and told my mom to meet me in the complete opposite direction. We eventually found each other and took a few pictures. Then I begged them to leave right away. I remember them being a bit surprised, but they chalked it up to me being tired from waking up early that morning. When I had a shift later that week, Chris came up to me and told me he had something to say. He revealed he had found out online where and when my graduation was and had planned to surprise me. He was sad he never found me, but he wanted to give me something. He handed me this envelope with a thick card inside and told me to open it later. I wish I could tell you what it said, but I was too scared to ever open it. I put it in my car and I either threw it out or it was just lost. I can't really remember. Kind of a boring ending, but Chris continued to talk to me and I would see his car around everywhere a few more times. But nothing else super intense happened after that. 
He was fired for no showing a couple of times, and I eventually moved out of state for college, so there was really no opportunity for it to happen. I never saw him again, and I am grateful for that. There were many more little things he did throughout the years we both worked there, but then this story would be insanely long. I can't even begin to remember all of them anyway. I think I didn't ever say anything for a couple of reasons. First, I was shy and thought I was overreacting, especially because no one else somehow seemed to think it was any weird how he acted. In fact, everyone really liked him and thought he was very cool. Second, he didn't really behave like the stalkers you see in a movie, at least personality-wise. He was very direct in wanting my attention, or wanting to be near me, and didn't ever hide that in front of other people. He came over immediately when we called him out in the movies, and he was very honest about going to my graduation after the fact. Obviously, I see everything crystal clear now, but it's almost as if I didn't say anything, because I really didn't want to believe what I was seeing either. Update. I doubt anyone will even see this, but an old co-worker of mine contacted me earlier this week and let me know that Chris is actually in prison right now. He's in a state about halfway across the country, convicted for sexual assault. Before I tell this story, which I'll of course be telling anonymously, I ask that anyone reading or listening, please try not to judge me too harshly. I know that's a lot to ask, especially when you actually hear the story, but I'm willing to guess that the majority of people who will soon know it have never and will never be put in a situation quite like it. As far as you know, you may have responded exactly like I did. I was one of those transplanted people who was born in the city and was moved out to the country as a teenager. I was 15 years old when my folks decided to move away from the city. It happened because my dad had fallen ill. His doctors had recommended that he retire early and do whatever he could to reduce his stress levels, so he retired. My parents sold our house and they bought a home in a very rural area. When transplanted people tell others that it's a major adjustment, they are not kidding. It was difficult to get used to the things that made the country and city differ. First was the lack of people. It wasn't like there were just less people. There was a total lack of people. The roads up the hills were either all dirt or covered in rocks. And while I'm at it, I really don't understand the point of those roads covered with rocks either. Wouldn't that be bad for the tires of a car? Wouldn't it make more sense to just leave it as dirt? I don't know. So, yeah, that was all really a shock to me. We moved right after the end of the school year. My parents figured it would be difficult enough for me to change school for the first time, much less have to jump in right in the middle of a school year. So, it was late May when we moved to the new place. Without school, it would be several months before I could even begin making new friends. There were other houses in the area, although they were not close. They were all senior citizens whose children had already grown up and moved away. I was in for a very long, hot, and quite lonely summer. I can't begin to tell you how much time I spent just doing everything indoors. I spent time on my computer, time watching movies, time reading books. I spent so much time not even getting to know my surroundings and just developing a bit of cabin fever. It was my mom who convinced me that I needed to begin exploring the area around me. I didn't really enjoy it too much at first, though. Walking up and down the rocky road was really not fun. It was just the same thing over and over again. I have to admit that I felt a little bit stupid after my mom explained to me that that was not quite what she meant. She wanted me to go and explore the wilderness areas that surrounded us. I started to go on some pretty short hikes at first. Each time I went, I just tried to get a little bit further and a little bit further after that. I was first getting worried about getting lost. It took quite a while before I was actually brave enough to wander off on my own. I very quickly discovered that I had to just bravely go and explore without that fear of getting lost in order to enjoy hiking at all. Once I did, though, I found that my mom was right. I sincerely enjoyed going out and exploring. It was such a different world, and I was enjoying finding the most of it. 
Yeah, I was still a little bit lonely, but that was no big deal. I suppose I should get to the point, though. I was out exploring for a long time one day. I ventured deeper and deeper out into the woods. Beforehand, I had traveled pretty far a few times, but I kept going deeper and deeper every time. I had never once run into any other people before, so I was surprised when I suddenly heard a noise that sounded like someone else was out there. It sounded like someone coughing, although I can't quite be sure, though. At first, I thought that maybe I should just head back home. I might have been trespassing on someone's private property without knowing it. But the more I thought about it, I decided that if I came across someone who owned the land, I could just tell them that I got lost. So, I walked in that direction that I was sure I'd heard the coughing noise come from. As I got closer and closer, though... I didn't hear any more noises. After walking for quite a bit, I realized that whoever, if anyone, had been out in the forest, they were probably long gone by now. Instead of walking back the way I had come, though, I cut back in a different direction. After walking for a short while, I came across the shock of my life. There was someone, a person, lying in the dead leaves on the ground. I stopped approaching them for a moment. I figured it must be someone who was injured, so I got up closer to the person. I approached, and the body still did not move at all. This frightened me, because I began to think this person must have been dead. A chill swept through my body when that thought rushed through my mind. As I got closer, I noticed the person was still moving, but he was severely injured. It looked like his arm was broken, and he had blood covering his entire face. As he saw me, he tried to get up. My instinct was to run, and run I did. I was just too freaked out. Not only that, I was also afraid that maybe the coughing sound I had heard was from whoever had attacked this man, and the last thing I wanted to do was draw that person right back there. That was the shameful thing I mentioned at the beginning of the story. I know it was the wrong thing to do, but at that moment, I was more concerned for myself than anyone. I ran in the direction that I assumed would take me back to the road. When I did, I kept going up the road and back to my house. The entire time, I kept expecting the guy who had done the evil deed would see me on the road and would do it to me too. When I got home, I immediately went to my parents and told them what had happened. My dad called the police but went out to get the car. It would take quite a while for the police to arrive and he didn't want the chance the guy dying before they got there. He told my mom to tell the police to look for his car on the side of the road. I had to go back with my dad to show him the approximate area it was when I made it back to the road. We then went out into the forest to look for the injured man. My dad brought his gun with him just in case we ran into the person who had done this. We did end up finding the man. He was still alive. I was extremely happy because if he had passed away... I definitely would have shared some of the blame for running away like a coward. My dad and I helped the man into the car and placed him in the back seat. The police hadn't quite arrived yet, so we drove back to the house. Shortly after we arrived, the police and an ambulance arrived as well. The man ended up living. The man who had done this to him in the first place was easily caught afterwards and then went to jail. I've always felt bad about this, and I realized that I should feel bad for what I did but I'm thankful that it all ended up good in the end. Around the time that I was 15 years old, I would spend certain parts of the summer with different relatives. As my immediate family was quite poor, I really enjoyed the time that I could spend with my aunt and her two children. She wasn't rich by any means. She lived in a trailer on the side of the road. It was a pretty nice trailer, though, and she always had air conditioning. She would take us to rent movies, and there was always at least decent food to eat and to have snacks. Nowadays, you won't find me swimming at all anymore, but at the time, I really enjoyed when we would go out into a creek in the area and just go for a swim. Getting to the creek originally took a small hike into the woods, but it was pretty easy to find because the creek was long and we would just follow it. The area that we would swim in was more like a spot of the creek that was like a pond than a flowing river. 
It was also deep enough for us to swim around and have a good time. One time during that summer, just my male cousin and I, who is practically my age, decided to go and swim by ourselves in the creek. His sister didn't want to come with us, and neither did mine, so it was just going to be the two of us. We were playing there, having a nice time, when something happened that had never happened before. All of a sudden, two older and much larger guys, maybe around 17 years old apiece, came up upon the creek. We didn't notice them at first, but once they began picking up our clothes and shoes, we noticed them real fast. My cousin Jim was the first one to notice. Hey, what the hell are you doing? He asked. He began to swim closer to the shore of the creek. Jim didn't get very far, however. Both of the older boys pulled switchblades out of their pockets. I wouldn't do that if I was you, they told Jim. He, of course, stopped. What the hell is wrong with you, Aaron? Jim asked. It was only at that point that I realized that Jim seemed to know these two people. We have the knives, so we'll ask the questions, Aaron told him. Who is this, Jimmy? Your new boyfriend? Screw you. Just for that, you give us your swim trunks. Aaron's friend instructed and both of them laughed. Hell no. Aaron and his friend stopped laughing. Aaron walked forward, brandishing his knife at my cousin. I'll come into the water and cut him off you, but if I do that, I'll be cutting off more than just those trunks. I'm not taking my damn trunks off, Jim said defiantly. I honestly didn't expect what happened next. Aaron jumped fully clothed into the water and began splashing around doing his best to chase after Jim. Of course, Jim was trying to get away, but he wasn't able to do a very good job at it. In no time at all, Aaron had Jim from behind and was holding him with his arm around his neck. I wonder what I'm going to cut off first, Aaron said angrily. He took the knife and pressed it against different parts of Jim's body. Maybe an ear would be good. Aaron's friend had been laughing at first, but he actually stopped and began to look really nervous. He didn't talk at all, though. Jim was also scared now. Okay, okay, I'll take off my shorts. Too late for that. Now you're going to lose a body part, too. Time froze for both of us, I think. Aaron pierced Jim's temple with the knife, and that got a strong reflex from Jim. He swung his arm out in pain and shock. Doing that caused Aaron to drop the knife, which fell into the creek. With the knife gone, I splashed over to where Jim and Aaron were. I was able to, along with Jim struggling, get Aaron off of him. Aaron's friend ran off while this was happening, rather than going into the water to help Aaron out. And without his knife, Aaron had no chance alone against both Jim and I. He spit over to the shore and out of the water. Once he was out, he began cussing up a storm, threatening both of us, and blaming us for losing his knife. He took our clothes and shoes and threw them into the water. Then he ran off. Jim and I collected our stuff, and he dove into the water to find the knife. After that, we went home. We told his aunt what happened, and we had the knife for proof as well. She called the police, and we went with them over to Aaron's house. The police took Aaron away, as my aunt had said she was absolutely going to press charges. I don't know what happened after that, though. It was a long time ago, and I'm not sure my aunt ever wanted to explain it to us, but it was a very scary experience for all of us involved. This happened when I was really young. I was at my grandma's house. She was divorced from her husband long before I was born. She lived with her two youngest sons, who were a lot younger than my parents were. My grandma, my aunts, and my dad were the type to go to bars a whole lot, and whenever we went to visit grandma, they would leave all us cousins at home while they went out and about and went drinking. My mom went with them because my dad insisted, but she had never been much of a drinker herself. My two uncles, the ones that lived with my grandma, were underage too, but they were supposed to be the ones watching us. They weren't even much older than us, though. I guess that was just sort of the way my family was back then. This night, it was like that. Everyone had been gone for quite a while. 
My uncles and my older brother knew that our parents would be out for quite a long time, so they had what they thought was a good idea. They were going to take the keys to my grandma's pickup truck and go out for a bit of a ride. Now, of course, they were not allowed to do anything like this, and they were not allowed to leave us alone either, so they decided that the three of them would sit in the front of the truck, and the rest of us four cousins would be sitting in the bed. There wasn't a top on the truck, so we were basically just sitting outside. My grandma lived way out in the country. The roads that we were driving on were narrow country roads that winded throughout the hills. To make things worse, my brother and uncle had taken a few beers out of the fridge and were drinking while driving the truck around. To give you a bit of an idea of how rural this was and how thin the road was, we several times had to duck to keep branches from scratching us on the face. I was the oldest of the four cousins in the back of the truck, and I was only nine years old, so you can imagine just how scary the experience was for us. It was dark as hell, and the only light was in front of the truck. Then, they stopped the truck at the end of a driveway. Taking their BB guns, they told the four of us to remain there until they got back. I was a nine-year-old, left with three younger children in the back of a truck in the hills, in the middle of the freaking night. I guess it was my job to keep us from being scared, but I was scared myself. So all I could do was sit there with those other three kids, looking around and trying not to get too frightened. Then, we heard a gunshot. It wasn't a BB gunshot. It was a real gunshot. All three of my younger cousins began crying right away. I pulled them closer to me and tried to keep them from being too frightened, but it was hard for me to do that when I was terrified. It wasn't long before my two uncles and my brother came running toward the truck. They got into it fast and yelled at us to keep our heads down, so we did. My uncle took off like a bat out of hell. He didn't have time to turn around, so we just went deeper and deeper into the hills. The driveway he was at was the place he could have turned around, but I guess he decided to keep looking for another. All four of us in the back kept hunkered down. However, I heard my uncles freaking out because they had gotten us lost. They didn't know how to get back and seemed like they were just as scared now as we were. I peeked up a few times, but it was too dark for me to see anything. We drove around for what seemed like forever in the dark. The other three children were crying, convinced we were never going to make it back home, and I was young enough to think that was true as well. Eventually, there was a light ahead of us. My brother and uncles lost their shit. They thought that the person who had shot at them had found them, but it was even worse for them. It was my mom. Our parents had gotten home and were all drunk but noticed we were gone. My mom went out looking for them with one of my aunts. My mom put us kids in the car, put my brother and uncles in the back of the truck, and my aunt drove the truck home when my mom drove the car home. Well, turned out what happened was that there was this old man who made moonshine and was basically a hermit. My brother and uncles got it in their mind to steal some of that moonshine, so when they noticed him, they shot him with a BB gun. That was when he started shooting back. Of course, my brother and uncles were in deep shit. I don't support spanking your kids, but after what happened, when my grandma handed each one of them a pocket knife and told them, all three of you cut me a switch, I didn't feel any sympathy for them at all. I ran away from home when I was a teenager. I just wasn't getting along with my stepfather and decided I needed to get away from my family. I had some cash saved up from my part-time job. Plus, I took some money from my stepfather, too. I guess I should feel bad about telling you that, but the truth is, I really didn't. He was quite an asshole, and I wouldn't even mind to this day if he knew that I did. So, I set off to God knows where, and, I mean, I really didn't have a plan at all. I thought I would just walk, maybe hitchhike my way across the country. I thought it might be a good idea to go to California, and I know how cliche that is, but I was underage, and California, for some reason, seemed like a good idea. I had enough money with me that I could have taken a bus or something, but I didn't want to do that either. 
I think it was because I had no idea what I was going to do when I got there, and I wanted to take the time to think about what I was going to do on the way. Besides, if I was hitchhiking, I might end up finding something, or someone, interesting along the way there. My story happened after I had actually made some distance in my journey. I walked a whole lot, and I actually got some rides too. A few of the rides were with semi-trucks, and I thought that was pretty neat. And the truck drivers were the ones that I liked the most. I was just leaving a town, walking my way out and hitching, when a red car pulled over. I got in and introduced myself to the guy driving. His name was Tony, or so he told me. He was just a normal guy, someone you'd expect to see working in an office building or something. He was going to a town that I was going to be going through, and let me know he could drop me off once we got there. I should probably mention that I didn't travel much when I was a kid, so I didn't know much about what the country looked like on the way to California. Though Tony and I were chatting, and the ride was convenient, there was just something about him that I didn't like. I could not put my finger on it, but it seemed like the entire thing was forced talking to me. I told myself simply that he was just not used to picking up hitchhikers, and maybe he was uncomfortable with the situation. I decided to test my thoughts out. Hey, so you pick up hitchhikers very often? I asked him. Tony nodded. Oh yeah, quite a few actually. I figure it's no big deal. I know some people think it's risky or scary, but hey, if I can help someone make it a few miles, then that makes me happy. He stopped for a moment and then looked at me. So I'm glad as I can to help. Again, there was just something off. Even his comment seemed a bit stilted, a bit forced. One thing I did notice, however, is that he never got on the interstate. We were driving down a regular highway, of course, so there were traffic lights and things like that, but it seemed odd to me that he never decided to get on the freeway. There were no tolls and no traffic lights, so it made more sense, but I just thought maybe that wasn't his style. We kept on driving. We went through several towns, and after that he began driving further away from the freeways. We were driving through the towns, and then we were going through less populated roads. We were no longer on the highway. We were just following these random routes. I had been in the car with Tony for a few hours when we were going through a rather hilly area. I just couldn't understand why he was driving like this, and I didn't want to ask him either, because it seemed just weird of me to do that. I decided to remain quiet as we went further on, but the further we drove, the more it seemed like he was not trying to take me to the city that I was going to. I wasn't exactly the best with directions, but I knew we were not going the way that we were supposed to go. I asked him about it at that point, and he just told me he liked to take the scenic routes, and that he hoped I didn't mind. At one point, we stopped at a gas station. He got back to the car before I did, and I think that I startled him as he was holding something, and quickly tried to hide it underneath his seat. It made me uneasy, but I still got in the car with him. Things then got really really odd. While we were driving on the roads, he turned off onto a much more rural road. Things quickly changed from even the small town vibe to the strangest of rural vibes, but that was not nearly as strange, nor as frightening, as when he drove down a random gravel road that was now taking us up a hill. I began to get very nervous due to this weird change. I tried telling myself that maybe the road led out to another that would take us back to asphalt. However, as we traveled further and further into the dark on that road into the hills, I began to get more nervous. We continued to make the small talk that we had been making for quite a while, when finally, the road pulled up to a gate. Looking out past the gate, I noticed that there was a long driveway that led up to a house. Where are we? I asked Tony. Oh, I just needed to make this stop to pick something up. You wait here and I'll be right back. Tony got out of the car. He hopped over the gate and began walking up to the house. And when he was out of sight, I decided to check and see what it was he had stuffed underneath the seat at that gas station earlier. Reaching under his chair, I pulled out a large knife. At that point, everything that happened that evening came together for me. 
There was the strange behavior of Tony when we talked, seeming like he was hiding something from me. The actual hiding of the knife under the seat of the car when he saw me coming back, and finally this weird trip into these random hills that made no sense at all. He had taken his car keys with him. Honestly, if he had left them in the car, I would have just driven his car out of there, but I didn't have that option. I left the car and took the knife along with me. I ran down the road a bit and then veered off into the trees. I had been hitchhiking for a long time anyway, so it didn't bother me to have to walk out in the hills back to where I had to go. I kept going through the woods for as long as I could. I didn't stray too far from the road, though. I saw a few times as Tony's car drove by and I noticed him shining his flashlight out into the woods. I was always in a good spot, though, so he never noticed me, but I was sure he was looking for me, which then just reinforced my paranoia that he was up to no good at all. I kept walking until I got back to the main road. It took me a couple of hours, but I did make it back, and then I was able to make it to the next town without any problem. Walking on the open road was a lot scarier than walking in the woods had been, though. At least then, I'd had a hiding place. As I was walking out in the open, I kept expecting every car zooming by to be Tony's, and I expected something bad to happen to me. But thankfully, nothing ever did. I made it to town, and the following day I was picked up by another semi-truck. For the rest of the trip, I just rode in those semis, because it seemed far safer to me. I mean, those guys were out working, and likely not trying to kidnap me or whatever. I admit I really have no idea if Tony was up to no good, but the pieces of the puzzle all fit together seem to indicate just that. When I was a young teenager boy, I guess I wasn't obsessed with all the same things as the other guys were obsessed with. Don't get me wrong, I liked girls, but I just wasn't trying to get all the girls in the sack all the time. No, I was in search of love, and I was hoping I would be able to find it at such a young age. It feels a bit silly now being older, and realizing just how difficult a thing love is to come by as an adult, much less a kid who really knows nothing about it. Of course, I would never have had the nerve to ask any girl out on a date. Most of all, I would start liking some girl, whether she was out of my league or not. Then I would pine for a while, walk around with head down, depressed at myself for being like this. I guess you're wondering just what this has to do with my story. Well, it's setting up so you can understand what I was going through at the time. You see, I had a crush on this girl when I was 14, and I nearly had up the nerve to ask her out on a date. But it was the end of the school year, and I just let my chance skip right by me. I knew I wouldn't be able to see her again until the end of summer, because she didn't live anywhere near me. I realized that I would be just spending my entire summer alone. I spent the entire summer not being able to sleep well. I would get up and go for walks then. I would walk around with my head down, watching my feet kick rocks along the road. It was during one of these walks at night that I came across something really, really scary. I lived in a house that was down the road from a hill. There was a small neighborhood right there, and I normally would walk around in that neighborhood, but this time I walked down the road and went over to a road that led up into a hill. I had never walked down this road on the hill before, mostly because I figured it was probably the private property of someone else, but this time, I wanted to go somewhere I had not been before. So, as I walked along, I looked up at the hill and decided to take the road that way. Like I said, I was feeling pretty down and out at the time, so I just spent all the time deep in thought. The road I took wasn't one that I had ever taken before. I was walking uphill, all the way to the top of the hill. There were no driveways or anything like that. I wasn't surprised, though, because a lot of these old country roads led to houses of people who wanted to live way out in the country, as rural as possible. Now, it was when the road got to the top of the hill, and then I was beginning to descend a bit, that things started to get a little weird. The road wound down the hill, and eventually around another one, but what I noticed at the bottom of the hill was some sort of light. 
It was hard to tell what it was coming from at first, so I walked a little bit downhill in order to see if I could try and make out whatever it was. After walking for a while, I discovered that what I was looking at was a car with its headlights on. However, the car was not in motion. It was just sitting in the road, sitting sideways, blocking the path. The lights were shining off the road into the forest. I was both curious and a little freaked out by this. It didn't make much sense to me that someone would be blocking the road, and of course that meant I was not going to be walking down the road much further. I really didn't want to come into contact with anyone. Suddenly, there were three gunshots. Shotgun shots. I was startled, nearly jumping out of my skin. After hearing gunshots, I should have turned and left. I was scared, but I was also curious as to what might be going on. I stood there and watched for a little bit, wondering if I was going to hear anything else. But I didn't. I did see something, though. The car was moving now. It straightened up in the road, and the lights were now pointed towards me. The car started moving very slowly, driving down the road at me. I retreated a little bit. The car was moving very, very slowly. I was able to make it up back to the top of the hill, but then I realized that even though it was moving slowly, it was still moving faster than me. I began to get scared, and I felt I had good reason to be. There was no reason I could think of that someone would be shooting a shotgun at this time of night. Hunting in that area was not allowed after dark. And besides, I doubted that hunting was allowed on that area at all. Of course, I wasn't exactly sure about that. I decided to get off the road and let the car pass by. My curiosity was still piqued, though, wanting to figure out just what was going on. So I hopped off the road and climbed up a tree. That way I could see as the car passed. It took a while before the car came into view, but when it did, I was shocked by what I saw. There was indeed the old car driving up the hill, but it was flanked by three men in front of the car, all carrying shotguns. They were walking slowly, while someone in the car was shining a spotlight out on either side of the road. They were obviously looking for something. Fortunately, the light was never shown up into the tree I was in. I can't tell you there was anything abnormal looking about the men themselves. They just looked like your standard country boy types. But the fact that they had shot at something earlier, and were now obviously looking for something in the woods, scared me deeply. Either they were up to no good, or they were hunting something, and that was no good itself. Those were the only two logical options I was able to think about. So I waited up there until they passed, and after they had passed, I waited a little while longer as well. I was scared to death at that point. I wasn't thinking that they were doing something wrong, but I still didn't want to take that chance. I was more scared that there was something or someone in the woods that they were after. That was the most terrifying part of it, wondering whether or not I was out in the woods with some escaped lunatic, or something even worse, if there is something worse. I waited for a bit and finally got the nerve to climb down the tree. I made it back over to the road and began walking from where I had come from. It was nerve-wracking. Every moment I was expecting something to jump out at me. At that point, my mind was coming up with so many possibilities of what may be going on here. The car didn't come back, though. I was able to make it back to the asphalt road, but my nerves were shattered by the time I did. I was literally trembling and was not comfortable until I made it all the way back home. Well, it turned out I had been partially right. There were these two men who had just escaped from the county jail, not the day before. Both were up on some pretty nasty charges. I came to the conclusion that the guys I saw were probably out manhunting for them. I don't know for sure, but I began wondering if I had moved in the woods, if they would have shot at me thinking I was one of those escaped convicts. Well, anyway, I suppose that I should tell you that I never thought about the girl again. She completely skipped my mind until the next school year, and I wasn't interested anymore. I wasn't exactly sure how to tell this story at first. It didn't happen to me but I feel like I should tell it in the first person. My grandma was born in the 1930s. Thankfully, she's still hanging on today, 
but when she tells me stories, they come from a world I could never even imagine, so I'll try my best to show you what happened. My grandma grew up in the country, and not the country that most people are used to. When someone has a house they buy out in the hills, and they have cable phones and electricity, my grandma didn't have any of that. She lived in a little shack, and was eventually one of eleven children. They often didn't have enough food, and they relied on their dad going hunting. This was in the 1930s, and since it is, things were very, very different. My grandma was only five years old at the time. She had a brother who was possibly about two, and although she didn't actually tell me why, one day they decided to go out to a swimming hole. Her parents were off doing something else, and left my grandma, who was five years old, to watch her younger brother. It's always weird when she tells me this story. I can't imagine having a five-year-old being responsible for a two-year-old, but she assures me that this sort of thing was not out of the ordinary for the time and place that she lived. While her parents, who would be my great-grandparents, were off doing something, this five-year-old girl in the middle of nowhere was left to watch a toddler right next to a swimming hole. Well, this is where it gets weird. I know that an 80-year-old memory is probably really flawed, but she swears up and down that she saw an arm grab her little brother and him falling into the swimming hole. Being five years old, my grandma could not swim herself yet. She began yelling and screaming, trying to get the attention of her parents. She didn't know what else to do. She ran over to the swimming hole and tried to grab her little brother, but she was unable to reach him. The entire time, he was yelling at someone who didn't seem to be there to let go of him. It didn't take too long until the screaming drew the attention of my great-grandparents. They came over and found their son flailing around for his life in the swimming hole. Her dad was able to jump into the water. He grabbed his son. My grandma still swears to this day that when he grabbed the boy and pulled him out of the water, she saw an arm and a hand wrapped around his leg, and when her dad tugged hard enough, the hand let go and went back under the water. A lot of things could have happened here. It could have been her imagination that she noticed the hand there. It's possible she never even saw the arm, and her memory added it later afterwards. Some people might think it was a ghost. But here's the thing. It doesn't really matter what it was. My grandma believed she saw what she told us. Whether she did or not, it was a horrifying memory for her. For some reason, either she really saw this, or her memory added it later. Either way, it was terrifying. I mean, she believed that she witnessed something. That she saw something pull her younger brother into the water and try to kill him. That on its own is damn scary. And of course, things being like they were at the time, her parents punished her for letting it happen in the first place. Yeah, they punished a five-year-old child for not properly watching a two-year-old. I really hope that things have changed since. I've always wanted to write scary stories since I was younger, and although I think I am and have always been a very decent writer, I've never really been much of an idea guy. It's hard to think up new scary stories, especially so when there are so many ideas and things that have already been done to death. I wanted to come up with a new idea, and not just the same thing over and over again. There's a lot of rural area around where I live, and I guess that's one of the things that inspired me to be a horror writer. The woods and even the fields can be a really scary place where you can come up with all sorts of terrifying happenings. It also gets a lot darker out in that area than it does in urban areas. I know that mostly because I live in a more urban area at the moment. Anyway, on with the story. This happened in the fall. I was still in high school at the time. That was the time when I was writing the most stories, and I guess that was why I was running out of inspiration. I was a bit underwhelmed by the beginning of the school year that year. I wasn't having a challenging time, so I was looking for something to really get my mind going. Of course, I thought that writing a scary story would be just the thing to do. The only problem was that I was having a really hard time thinking of an idea. 
About the third week of school, I realized I was fully blocked, so I decided to go for a walk at night. Sometimes something as simple as just going on a walk is a really good way to get new ideas and inspiration for stories. So, I went out for a long one. I lived on a country road myself, but I wasn't that far away from a small town. There were some neighborhoods around as well. I walked down the road in the dark, just trying to get my mind to come up with something. I walked on down off the gravel road, and actually made it to the paved road. I figured ideas were not coming to me yet, so I might as well keep going for as long as I could. I walked into a neighborhood that a friend of mine lived in. I wasn't intending on going over to his house, but I was familiar with the area, so I could walk up and down the streets and I wouldn't have to worry about getting lost. Right on the edge of that neighborhood were these really small patch of woods, and there were also some houses around. I want to try and explain this as well as possible, so you can understand and visualize what the area looked like. The woods were on the right side of the street that I was walking on. On the left side were houses that were facing the road that bordered the neighborhood that I was walking in. There was another line of houses that were facing away from that direction, so these two rows of houses had their backyards facing each other. Now, there was an old paved road that ran behind and through both roads of houses. There were a lot of trees lined up and down both sides of the street. Plus, there were no street lamps, and there was rarely any light from the moon either. It got very, very dark back there. I debated whether or not I wanted to try going on a walk through that area. I had walked through it before with my buddy, but I had never done it by myself at night time. Still, I told myself there would be a good idea, because maybe I would get a little bit scared, and maybe being scared would be enough to jog my inspiration for a scary story. I wasn't feeling particularly scared that night, though, and I doubted deliberately trying to make myself scared was going to be inspiring. However, there were some houses there that had some outside dogs. I wouldn't see them, and I thought at the very least I might get a good jump scare. I decided to go through with it. When I first started walking down the street, I could still see the leaves that were falling off the trees behind the two houses. But as I walked just a little bit further, it gradually became almost completely pitch black. I'm sure most of you have watched some horror movies. One of the things that we do when we watch those movies is brace ourselves for possible jump scares. And that's exactly what I was doing. I was tensed up, just waiting for it to happen. As I kept walking, I didn't hear any noise other than the crunching of my own feet on the dead leaves on the ground. It was quiet, and I got tenser and tenser. I kept expecting the bark, but began getting apprehensive in expectation of it too. Even though I'd been hoping for a jump scare, I began to really not want it to happen. I think you all know that sort of feeling that I'm trying to describe to you. Suddenly, there was a sound. Nothing but a low, grumbling sound. Sort of like when a dog talks back to its owner, like he's mumbling under his breath. And that was it. I stopped walking. It was still dark, so I couldn't see the dog or much of anything, but I did look over in the direction that I'd heard the dog make the sound. Really? I asked the dog. That's the scariest sound you can make? Well, when you strangle a dog, he can't bark at someone walking by. I heard a voice from the direction of the dog whisper to me. I experienced something much different than a jump scare just right then. It was something I hadn't experienced before, and haven't since either. It was a wave of fear moving through my entire body. It was cold dread. That's the only thing in the world I can think of that could describe it. My legs reacted much quicker than my mind did, though. They picked up and began hauling butt down the street. The only thing I was thinking of was that I had to get to the end of this road and back into the light as quickly as possible. So I ran and ran, almost tripped several times. I didn't quit running until I got underneath a street lamp. At that point, I turned around and looked. I didn't see anyone coming after me. All I noticed was the trees covering the road and the leaves that were steadily falling from them. As before, it was now completely silent outside. I turned and began to go home. It took a while, but eventually I calmed down. 
Now, I didn't get completely calm until I arrived home, and even then I was still a bit on edge. But I guess I got what I was looking for. The funny thing is, this happened years in the past. I've written many stories and things since then, but never put this story down until just now. I never really enjoyed my visits to my relatives' houses after I was a teenager and then an adult. The reason behind this is that when I was a teenager and the oldest of my cousins, who were mostly quite a bit younger than I was, I was still treated like I was one of those younger kids. The last thing I wanted to do when I was 16 years old was go out and play with kids around the age of 11. This continued well into my late teens and early 20s. My grandma, aunts, and uncles would hang out, and because I wasn't married, they still acted like I was one of the younger kids. They would insist that I go outside and play with the young ones. I stopped visiting for a few years because I was tired of just always being treated like that. It wasn't until my late 20s that I decided to go and visit again. And when I did, it was when my mom went to visit, so I accompanied her down there. I had one uncle who I didn't see a lot while I was growing up. He would travel around looking for work or people to live with, along with his longtime girlfriend at the time. He was my Uncle Bill, and I always enjoyed being around with him when I was younger. He wasn't as tightly wound as all my other relatives. Of course, this meant that he often did a lot of drinking and also a lot of drugs. He got fired from a lot of jobs, and even spent some time in jail. That, of course, made it harder for him to get good jobs going forward, so he would often work under-the-table jobs. Well, on this visit, a lot of my relatives were over at my grandma's house. Fortunately, because they had missed seeing me, my relatives were not treating me like a kid anymore. Another one of my uncles wanted to take me over to his house and drink some whiskey with him, but his wife didn't really want that going on, so that didn't happen. But my Uncle Bill lived in his little shack out in the hills. He lived there for free with his wife, a different one than the one I was used to growing up, that was provided to him by a guy he did farm work for. He asked me if I wanted to come over and have a beer with him. His wife liked those flavored drinks like Smirnov Twisters and things like that. I had never had a beer before, and I almost declined, but she told me I could share her drinks with her. So, I went. I had a few of those drinks. I also had a beer for the first time in my life, and my uncle had also had some weed to smoke. I had done that before, but I didn't exactly tell him that. He was happy I had my first beer with him, so I had no problem having him think I would have my first joint with him too. It was a really nice afternoon that moved on into the evening. I was having a nice time, but also, all of the drinking and weed had really begun having an effect on me now. I was beginning to get drowsy, feeling like I might pass out or fall asleep. When I woke up, it was to what sounded like a gunshot and an ear-shattering scream. I was still out of it. It took me a few moments to figure out where I even was. When I did, I noticed that I was in the small shack by myself with my uncle's wife. My uncle was not in the building, but I could hear him shouting something at someone. Getting up, I went to look out the window. She tried to stop me, but I was too curious. The little shack was up in the hills on a dirt road. It was right on the edge of an orchard. It was an odd setup, because I had never seen an orchard out in the hills like that, although it was beautiful. That was what my uncle did work on, and he was standing there at the edge of the orchard. That's when I saw lights coming from the orchard. There were a couple of them, and I figured they had to be flashlights or something. When I saw them, I heard another gunshot. I realized then that the gunshots had been fired by my uncle. The lights retreated for a moment, and then they shut out. When my uncle came back, I noticed he was bleeding severely. His wife helped him out, and my uncle explained to me what had happened. Apparently, while I had passed out, the guys that had worked on the orchard and previously lived in the shack came by to harass him for taking their job. They had been kicked out by the owner of the orchard and had been occasionally tormenting my uncle and his wife. The shack didn't have any door on it, and they had gotten in, threatened my uncle and his wife while I was passed out, and in the heat of the argument, 
had stabbed my uncle with a knife. The relatives generally always had a rifle or a shotgun in the house, so my uncle retrieved it and chased the men out into the orchard. Despite the guys leaving, I felt very uncomfortable the rest of the time I was in the shack. It was scary in the dark, in the hills, to be in a shack with no door on it in the edge of a dense orchard, knowing that the people who had attacked him could come back at any time in the protection of the dark. We weren't there for very long, though, before my other uncle showed up. He had heard the shots and came to see what was going on. They took me back to my grandma's and my uncle to the hospital. The next time I visited, my uncle was not working in the orchard nor living in the shack anymore. I never found out what happened with the two people who had attacked him. I've only had one really scary experience in my life, and to this day I still can't really explain it. I'll wait until the end of the story to tell you why, however, since I don't want to give away spoilers too soon. When I was 16 years old, my family was going down south to visit some other family. I didn't exactly want to go, for many reasons. Mostly because I knew that if my family were away, my dad would leave the keys for the spare car, and then I could go and drive it around without any fear of getting caught. We lived in a beautiful area out in the country. We were only there for a couple of years, and it was so long ago. I haven't lived in a place like that ever since. Ours was in a hilly area. He had to drive out of town through the rolling hills, into the higher hills to get to where we lived on. And although you could look down on a lot of the lower hills in front, not so much so into the higher hills behind or around us. Anyway, my family was out of town, and I decided to go driving around. I went into town, picked up a few friends. We did a few things together and hung out a bit into the night. However, my buddies had to get home. However, my buddies had to get home, and they all lived in town. So I decided to drive back out to my area. Well, my last friend I took home lived a bit out of town. I dropped him off last and then decided to head on my way home. However, rather than driving back to town and then through the rolling hills, I thought I would take the back way around. I had never been in that area, and I thought my sense of direction would help me out. Although I didn't think I was lost, I ended up driving into the higher hilly area for quite a bit. I had learned to drive on roads like this, so I was used to doing it. It was dark, and the road was narrow, and although I had driven on these sorts of roads to learn, I hadn't done so in the middle of the night. The darkness was the scariest part of the whole thing. While I was going downhill, what I thought was the scariest thing possible happened. The car died, and when it did, it continued coasting down the hill, all the way to the bottom of it. I tried starting it, but I realized that the battery was low. It was not uncommon for that to happen with this car, so I decided to just let it rest for a while before I tried again. It was a scary thing just sitting in that dead car. I locked the doors, which seemed silly too. It wasn't like I was in a dangerous urban area in the city where someone was going to break into my car or something. There were not a lot of houses out in this area, and people who did live out here were generally pretty well-to-do people. I still was at an age, though, where I could occasionally be afraid of the dark, and I did let it get to me a little bit. Maybe about 40 minutes after I had stalled, I noticed some lights from behind me. A car or truck pulled over to the top of the hill, the one I had just rolled down. The light from the headlights shone all over me, but rather than come all the way down the hill, the car stopped at it. The light just shone on me. I couldn't figure out why exactly, except if I was possibly blocking the way on the very narrow road. Rather than just remaining at the top of the hill, though, I thought they would at least come down and ask me what was wrong. Maybe they would be able to give me a jump. But rather than do anything like that, the car just remained sitting at the top of the hill, the light shining down on me. After about ten minutes, I was beginning to get very worked up. It seemed like it was an extremely weird situation. I was about to try and start the car again, when I heard a door slam. I thought maybe the driver was finally coming down to check on me, but after a few moments, 
I noticed someone standing in the light of the vehicle. Rather than walk down to see me, he just stood there illuminated in the light. The fear kept building up over and over. The situation was getting weirder and weirder. Finally, I noticed the guy begin slowly walking down the hill. However, I suddenly didn't really want him to. The situation was way too freaky by this point. It was then that I heard a revving noise. It seemed familiar, but I was not sure what it was when I first heard it. After a few revs, though, the motor started. The silhouette of the man then took on a much more ominous shape. The man was holding a chainsaw, and he was slowly walking towards me. I paused for just a moment. The moment didn't last long, as I decided to try and drive the car for the first time. I'll spare you the horror movie cliché, though. The car started on the first try, and when it did, I blasted off down the gravel road as quickly as I could. I drove really fast, and didn't slow down until I got to our driveway. When I got out of the car, I looked down our long driveway and down the hill. I did not see a car or truck coming in my direction. I went into my house and remained there for the night. I have no idea who that had been in the car with the chainsaw. I had no reason to believe it was anyone I knew, or anyone who had anything against me either. I mean, it's possible it was just some crazy motherfucker who was going to hurt me for blocking the road. It could have been a guy who was just trying to scare me for the sake of scaring me. Well, mission accomplished, if so.